I am Teresa Clark. I am the chairman and CEO of Africa.com, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to today's session, a workshop for women who are on the path towards their leadership careers in public service across Africa. As many of you know, Africa.com is in collaboration with Coca-Cola Africa, and together we launched the Women Heads of State Initiative on March 23rd of this year. And as part of that initiative, we are delivering free virtual training workshops for women early in their public service careers in any of Africa's 54 countries. Our goal is to empower female civil servants while strengthening the pipeline of women civil servants across Africa. We chose to focus on women in public service for a very particular reason. As the Mo Ibrahim Foundation pointed out, in a recent report on public service in Africa, public service is a pillar of governance. Without strong public services and committed public servants, there will be no efficient delivery of expected public goods and services, nor implementation of any political commitment, however strongly voiced across Africa. But even still, despite its fundamental role in governance and leadership, public service in Africa is seldom considered. It attracts very little interest. When people talk about Africa's potential, there is a tremendous amount of focus on entrepreneurship and political leadership at the very top. No one praises the unsung heroes who actually deliver public services day in and day out and who can make a tremendous difference as Africa moves forward to take its rightful place on the global stage with its young and growing population. So today, we look to address that in a, in a, in a modest way. Africa.com is using the platform that we have. We've all learned over the last two years, the power of distance learning and the relationships we have with the likes of those who are going to be presenting to you today to try to make a small contribution to the development of women in the pipeline for public service across Africa. I couldn't be any more excited to introduce those who are joining us today. We're going to start off with a wonderful presentation from the Prime Minister of Namibia. This is the third time that we will have welcomed the Honorable Sarah Kugongelwa Amadila to our platform. And she has three pieces of advice for women who are at the beginning stages of their government careers. We'll be followed by Ms. Patricia Obuzwa. Patricia, someone else that we know quite well, is the Vice President of Public Affairs and Communications at, at, at Coca-Cola Africa. And she will be giving advice based on her deep experience in public affairs across Africa on how to kickstart your career in public service across Africa. We'll then be followed by Professor Chris Stone, who is the Professor of Practice of Public Integrity at the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University. He is going to be joined with a fantastic panel of women who have been where you are, women who are leaders in public service across the continent representing Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, and Egypt. I can't wait to hear that conversation about how to lead and advance a culture of integrity. Following Chris's panel, we'll have another session led by Gorik Ng. Gork Ng is a career advisor at Harvard University and the author of the Wall Street Journal bestselling book, The Unspoken Rules of Getting Your Career Off to a Good Start. Gork is going to be joined by another fabulous panel of women from Ghana, South Africa, and Sierra Leone, who also serve in public administration and will be able to share their experiences on how they got their career started off on the right foot. Actually, I'm sorry, we also have on that panel two other fantastic contributors who are from Liberia and come to us via our relationship with the Ellen Johnson Sirleaf Foundation. And we send a very warm welcome to you for this collaboration under the Women Heads of State Initiative. So that is the plan that we have for today. And with no further ado, we're going to move forward to the remarks, the three pieces of advice from the Prime Minister of Namibia. Now, I just want to tell you that we recorded this yesterday uh, to ensure that we had no technical problems, but the Prime Minister is deeply committed 
to this. And so she is also here with us today, in addition to having recorded yesterday. She's given us two days of time to make sure that she could deliver to you as best as possible. So we wanted to make sure that there were no technical problems. So that's why we recorded it. So we're going to roll that video, but she's here and happy to take questions after we finish her video. So Prime Minister Sarah, we thank you so much for your deep commitment to this work, to young women, to mentoring young women in government. And with that, I turn it over to the video. Thank you very much, Ms. Teresa Clark, CEO of Africa.com, Professor Chris Stone of Oxford, Mr. Gorik Nge of Harvard, Ms. Patricia Obozua, Coca-Cola Company, and the seven women civil service leaders from different African countries who will be speaking on panels with us today. I feel privileged to be part of this commendable initiative aimed at improving the effectiveness of women's work in serving the public. At the onset, I wish to congratulate the organizers for using the power of online learning to train young women in government across the continent for free. For the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development to be achieved, effective public service is needed. Public servants sit at the heart of formulating plans and strategies to achieve sustainable development. Therefore, they need to be capacitated to ensure more responsive public services. In this regard, I hope to see a large number of women participating in this training to empower themselves to excel in their performance. Public servants are required to have a profile characterized by trustworthiness, transparency and accountability, risk-taking, quick thinking, creativity, versatility, and self-sacrifice, amongst others. For example, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, public service and public servants, many who were used to operate in routine, predictable, and regulated systems, had to deploy quick thinking, instant creativity, and innovation to counter the distraction caused by the pandemic in service delivery. For women to effectively play the above-mentioned roles, they need to continuously increase their knowledge and skills as they are expected to perform a wide range of jobs at various levels. Public service has its fair share of challenges, but I can testify that many tend to stay in public service for their entire career. This is because a career serving the public is unique in many ways. As a public servant, you perform a variety of roles, meet many challenges, and encounter people from diverse backgrounds, all of which provide unique opportunities to gain experience in diverse areas and to impact on people's lives in a manner that yields immense gratification. The study on importance of women in the public service releasing the potential indicated that since the historic 1995 Beijing Platform for Action, women made notable advancements in safeguarding their human rights, ending workplace discrimination, and improving their access to education. Yet when it comes to women's political participation, the statistics remain staggering. According to the Interparliamentary Union and Women, only 22% of national parliamentarians and 17% of the government ministers are female. Furthermore, of the 63 nations that have had a female head of government, two-thirds were in power for less than four years. The type of underrepresentation disadvantages countries in a magnitude of ways and serves as a hindrance to international development efforts carried out by national and multilateral institutions. The 2015 Power of Parity report by McKenzie and Company has shown that closing the global gender gap by 2025 could deliver 12 to 28 trillion dollars in additional annual GDP. Achieving this economic windfall, however, 
cannot be accomplished without women's equal representation in public service. As more women enter public service, they are able to advocate for the types of policies that impact a woman's ability to enter the workforce, such as paid maternity leave and equal pay legislation. Therefore, continuous empowerment of women is an important undertaking. I would like to refer to the Woman in Public Service Project, a program of the Global Women's Leadership Initiative at Wilson Center, which empowers the next generation of women around the world and mobilizes them on issues of critical importance in the public service. One of the justifying factors behind this program's mission is to ensure that 50% of public service leadership positions are filled by women by 2050. While there are clear economic and social advantages to having more women in the public service, one undeniable justification remains if women constitute 50 percent of the world's population then 50 percent of public service positions should be held by women this training therefore complements the work of this program which aims at accelerating global progress towards women's equal participation in policy and political leadership to create more dynamic and inclusive institutions that leverage the full potential of the world's population to change the way global solutions are forged. I need to emphasize that women's empowerment gives them equal status compared to men, which creates a frictionless environment for women and helps them to get rid of social violence and atrocities against them. It helps them to fight for their rights. I therefore wish to encourage women in public sector to continue their career with professional pride, have a true desire to save others, continue with commitment and desire to learn, set your goals high to serve in a meaningful and selfless way, and remember there will always be many times that you would fall. Be prepared to pick yourself up and forge ahead. The government of Namibia is committed to equip public servants with skills to allow them to improve service delivery. In conclusion, I congratulate the organizers of this important training and urge all participants to take this training seriously to gain the necessary skills to deal with pressing challenges in service delivery in the public sector. I thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister, for those wonderful words of guidance. We're going to, um, in the interest of time, the Prime Minister is going to stay with us this morning. We will address our questions to her later. And right now, we're going to move on to the first panel. The first panel is going to be run by Professor Christopher Stone, who is a Professor of Practice of Public Integrity at the Blavatnik School at the University of Oxford. Chris is someone that I've had the privilege to know for many years with respect to his many, many roles across the continent of Africa. He knows Africa extremely well. He has been in the, he ran the Vera Institute many years ago, which when I first became aware of him, we both serve the Legal Resources Center of South Africa, a very important institution that provides human rights for the people of Southern Africa. He pre previously ran the Open Society Institute the very large nonprofit that is founded by George Soros. He's had a wide range of roles with respect to Africa and its governance. Um, he reads more than anything else. I think that uh, when we come to what is happening today in South Africa, he's told me that he plans to be one of the 10 people who have read the current Zondo report. So he knows Africa very, very well and will be in a fantastic position to lead a conversation on advancing a culture of integrity. Joining Chris are four speakers. We have Ms. Temujula Abisoye, the CEO and Executive Secretary of the Lego State Employment Trust Fund from Nigeria. We thank you very much for being with us. We have Abina Asare, who is the Head of Human Trafficking and Secretariat in the Minister of Gender, Children and Social Protection from Ghana. We also have Rose Masharia, the Chief of Staff to the Chief Justice of the President of the Supreme Court of Kenya, and Ms. Aweda Kamel, who is the Director of Strategic Marketing, Information Technology, Industry and Development Agency 
in Egypt. What a fantastic group of women who bring their experiences to this conversation. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris to start this panel. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you all for joining us today. It's really exciting to be here, and I'm just humbled and looking forward to the conversation with these four extraordinary colleagues um, from across the continent. Um, I'm, I'm Chris, and uh, please use, uh, please, please uh, just use my first name. And um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. We're gonna start um, and just go in the same order that uh, Teresa has just introduced us all. So start with Teju. Um, and I, I wanna ask uh, each of you one question, but before I do, let me just give all of our, all of our participants and all those joining um, a little guide. We are going to be taking your questions um, responding to your concerns um, and, and uh, any comments you want to make, please use the chat or the Q&A um, uh, to, to let us know what you would like uh, to ask the, the members of the panel. We're, gonna, we're going to uh, uh, take about the, roughly the first half of our hour together uh, to hear from them uh, in response to some questions I will pose, but then we want to come to your questions. So please uh, don't wait. Um, as questions occur to you, uh, please add them in, and our um, colleagues uh, from the team will be facilitating the conversation um, uh, after after our our opening remarks. Um, so, Tija, let me let me start with you. I want but I want to ask each of you. Are everyone has seen your impressive biographies? We know we know your current role. We know a lot about the education, Tiju, your master, your your several master's degrees, Abina, your 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 legal training, Rose. I, I'm sorry I missed you at the Blavatnik School of Government, but uh, your master's in public policy here in 2016 at Oxford, and your other educational background, and and Hawaida, Hawaida, um, your your own um, MBA, I believe, and uh, and other training. We have all that. You don't need to tell us about that. But tell us about something from before the CV starts. Tell us, tell us when you first recognized in yourself um, that you were playing a leadership role in whatever that context was, in school, in your community, um, in, in any context, in an early job. Um, tell us, just share something about what it was uh, that first gave you an idea that you might, you might uh, be be capable of leading others um, in your own in your own work, in your own life, in your own career. Um, Tisha, let's start with you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, Teresa, Laura, thank you for having me. I count it a privilege to be part of this conversation. So Chris, straight to your question, I tell people my first memory of life itself was when I was five years old and it was my birthday. And all I can remember is everybody following me everywhere. I was leading a park, like, you know, the top of the park, like the leader of the park. And that's my earliest memory of myself. And going from there, I see myself every year, school, I, in primary school. So, you know, I actually set up a, a, a community of women, four girls. We called ourselves Four Birds. And I was elected the chairperson or the president of the group. Moving to secondary school, um, I didn't do too well, but I was elected president of the Z Club, which is part of Zonta International in my penultimate year in school. I didn't make class prefect, I didn't make head girl. When I got to university again, the cycle starts again. I was elected class representative for my five years in university. And even in law school as, um, as a class representative again. So there was something about it. I got voted as most likely to become UN Secretary General in university. So I kind of recognized the fact that there was just something about not being able to hide my skills. I've been able to stand out in the park and that has followed me everywhere I've gone. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. That's great. And it's, a, and it's a mixed blessing not being able to hide. You have to, it can be a little scary, but then you, uh, you clearly took it up and it's great. Here, well, we'll come back to you in just a minute. Let me ask Avita the same question. Um, go, go back before the CV starts. What, what was your first um, uh, sense of your first experience of or noticing your own, your own leadership? 
Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, everyone, for this opportunity. I'm glad to be here. I think um, Teju has taken us through way back uh, uh, five years ago. So I'll go straight to my working experience and how I realized that leadership doesn't really have to come at the top position, but you need to start really wherever you are. And so it all started in a workshop that um, my bosses were not able to attend. And in that particular workshop, everyone pointed to the fact that as a ministry, you are government, and so you are to do a lot more. And they spoke as if you, the individual there, was the whole government. And so you need to take up your responsibility, and the people expect something more from you. And so I came back home, and I started thinking, what is the meaning of you are the government? You are to do a, B, C, because society is looking up to you. At that time, I was just a new entrance into the service and I was posted into the human trafficking service. You really don't really understand the magnitude of the whole issue and you have been asked that you are the government and you are to do this. CSOs are looking up to you, NGOs are looking up to you. Some even government institutions are looking up to you to do your duty. And so I came back and I spoke to my boss and my boss said, you are a leader. So start taking up that responsibility. If you were to be in my shoes, what would you do? And he got me thinking and he gave me a book, um, 360 Degrees Leadership. And so I started reading that book and I realized, okay, wherever you are, you can start that particular um, role. And so I started doing things and showing to him, I mean, as if you are the boss. So he said, walk like you are the boss, speak like you are the boss. When you are writing speeches, write like you are the one who is the boss going to read it. And for me, that is the starting point for me in the civil service in my career and how I started rolling. And today I am a leader. And so it, it makes life more simple, but it's not that simple. Um, I think later we'll talk about how the journey has been so far. So that's my little story. That's terrific. That's so that's that's great, Abina. And it's so important. I think everybody has that moment where someone turns to you and just says, You are a leader, and you have to figure out what that what that means for you. So that's hey. ter terrific. Rose, let me let me ask the same question to you. What's uh, what was your first first um, experience, first recognition of what it was uh, of, of your own leadership. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I think um, uh, I also regret uh, the fact that I left Lavatnik before uh, you joined because I think we'd have had a lot of great conversations at the window to the world, which is sort of uh, BSG's this uh, reflection window uh, where students sort of sit and think about global global challenges. Um, I was always an odd child, Chris. I had a lot of feeling and I'm a very feeling person and I noticed uh, different things, differences. Um, and I remember watching Escape from Sobibo, I think around 1991, 1992. I was right about around the age of, uh, um, you know, six, seven. Um, and I started to question how a leader could lead a movement against such brutality. Um, and Escape from Sobi was a movie, stayed with me. Um, and I remember having conversations with my uh, late father and those conversations persisted for, a, you know, for, throughout my life about why, what it meant uh, for entire communities to undergo um, attack and genocide um, and, you know, for, for leaders to use the powers that they had um, to, you know, sort of, inflict such pain. Um, and it stayed with me, uh, Chris, and last, in 2020, when I got the opportunity to visit Poland, I actually went to Auschwitz and the, the feelings that I had when I was seven uh, came back. But across you know, the course of my life, I always was on the lookout for leaders who were not um, leaders who could uh, sort of perpetrate that such, such you know, uh, devastation. The second um, incident, was uh, uh, my own Kenyan experience uh, with the 1992 tribal clashes. Um, and I remember you know, growing up in Nyandara County, which borders the Rift Valley um, in Kenya and visiting my auntie who lived near Molo. Um, and I remember staying awake at night. Um, I, I, I was about seven, staying awake at night and wondering if we would be attacked 
because we were um, of an unwanted or uh, an external tribal uh, identity. Um, and I, it is important or monumental for me that we're having this conversation today because the leader who brought me peace and the leader uh, who I truly admired um, passed away and that's Kenya's that president, uh, President Mwai Kibaki, um, who passed on and Kenya is currently in a period of national mourning because I followed his leadership through the Democratic Party movement. And thinking about him and, and, and those like him who really fought against di dictatorship and you know, fought to liberate our country's democratic processes brought me faith and hope um, as a really young child. And then of course, throughout my education, um, I became class prefect um, in standard one and was captain um, all, all right through to the end. And I remember being bothered by little things like, and I remember writing in my memoirs chapter recently that I was really bothered by the possibility that a young child uh, could walk to a teacher and ask permission to use the bathroom and a teacher would actually say no. And I started to be bothered by aspects of dignity. Um, and I didn't know that I was being bothered by these things, but that to me was what leadership was about. And so I became sort of like a rebel and I started to rebel against these things and to walk out of class without asking for permission if I needed to relieve myself. It wasn't an active rebellion, but in my own sense, I felt like I was rebelling against these untold injustices. And uh, I ended up um, in a career uh, where I pursued dignity um, and justice. And I think that's what I will do for the rest of my days. Back to you, It's a wonderful story. And I think it, uh, we're, we're going way back in, in lives to age five, in your case, age seven. But I think the, the, the point you've, you've added so important is that leadership for what? And leadership can be a, a terrible burden and can be a, can lead to tragedy, or it can also lead to to wider dignity, to liberation, um, in the way you describe. And so, understanding what leadership is for is just as important as understanding how how you how you become and recognize your own leadership. So, huge thanks for that. And let's let's go to Hueda. Um, if I can ask you the same same question. Um, where do you want to take us? When was when when did you first think of yourself or recognize yourself as a leader? It was late in my career. I mean, I started uh, when I started my career. I discovered my leadership style. I got in a situation where I have to organize uh, a presidential visit for uh, our president uh, Hosni Mubarak to Geneva, where he's signing with Kofi Annan an agreement. That I'm, I'm organizing everything. I'm going alone from Ministry of Communications. I'm holding all this responsibility. I'm talking to the officials there. I'm talking to the to my colleagues at the ministry. Uh, I don't have enough resources. I don't know what it takes to do this. Uh, and I spent uh, there around two weeks preparing for this big thing for me. And I came back as a leader from this. I discovered myself. At school, I was a shy girl coming from a very conservative family. Uh, I was a student a, uh, uh, whenever in all my classes, but I was too shy to talk, too shy to lead a team, too shy to present myself. But my manager in, in the Ministry of Communication, she noticed that I have these leadership styles that I just need to have the opportunity to show it up to the world. And she gave me this opportunity. Opportunity over opportunity, I led uh, so many projects, so many tasks that bigger than my age, my, uh, you, Ayani, at my age, we, we don't really have this managerial and leadership uh, in my country in the public sector. So it was really, really a nice experience to explore myself and it affected my personal life as well as a wife and as a widow and a, and a wife again and a mother for a kid. Uh, I, ha I had so many experiences exper Yani, uh, performing this leadership and now I'm, I'm entitled as a strong, active woman, unlike my childhood was totally a shy, cool girl who used to uh, play with her dolls and stay with her in her room and do her ballet. Uh, it was an opportunity through, through the public sector, through my work in public service. Thank you, everyone. 
Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's terrific. And I think, I think the four of you, I mean, these are, these are so good as stories. They're so different. And yet for each of you, I think there's, there's resonance for those listening that you, you can, you can, you can look at those experiences before you're ever put in a position that we might think of as big public leadership, the kind of roles you're each playing in your, in your own governments, your own countries now is obviously the, the experience of, of finding this in you, noticing that people follow you, being told, you know, being encouraged to think of yourself as a leader, to find and discover what you have within you that you can use in, in that way. All of these are, 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 are things I suspect many, many of those joining us today can, can resonate with and can find examples in their own lives. Let's, let's, we, 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 we've been brought together. Teresa has asked us to come together, not just to talk about leadership, but to talk about integrity and, and, and the, the challenges of, of leading, leading a life and doing work in service of the public, in service of public institutions, um, and, and maintaining that integrity in difficult circumstances under the pressures. The, um, when uh, here at the at the at the School of Government at Oxford, um, when we when we teach classes on, on on resistance of corruption and building and building cultures of integrity, one of the early lessons we we focus on is that is that purity is not an option. That the that if you if you try to if that if you have an image of of ethical purity. You will find yourself resigning on in principle very early in your career. That the challenge is how to maintain your own integrity, but also how to remain um, responsible and able to carry out, to live up to the responsibilities and the expectations that your family, that your community, that your village, that your state, that your country has for you. Um, and balancing those things is actually much harder than just following a, a, a single set of rules. It requires judgment. It requires an ethical sense um, and a strategic uh, sense um, that, that takes, takes years to, to develop and perfect. So one of the things I'd like to ask each of you is if you could tell us, a, tell us an example of something when in your career you were faced with with pressure, with, with an expectation that you were gonna do something or request to do something that violated your personal set of, of ethics, but wasn't necessarily worth resigning over and that you had to navigate how you were gonna cope, how you were gonna respond to that pressure short of simply saying, uh, uh, quitting the field. Um, these, these, uh, uh, I think we we find that almost anyone in a position of authority has these experiences, and it's a and and there's not a rule book about how you navigate them. But one of the tragedies is we don't speak about them a lot, and so many people have to face these moments isolated and feeling like they have no one to turn to. Um, so I just hope maybe you could each share one example of some moment in your career when you were asked or expected to do something that, that violated your own sense of ethics, but, but wasn't something you were gonna resign over, how did you, how did you handle that, that moment, that situation? Tisha, let's, let's start again with you. Okay, thank you again, Chris. Okay, so I think from what I have seen so far, but I like the, what you said about, it takes a while to get to perfection, is it's really all around managing political or stakeholder interests around how you actually navigate um, this request in code. So yes, and from what you also said, that leadership, that sense of responsibility and understanding why you are, you now have this responsibility to deliver something to like the matters rather than just yourself. So very quickly, I'll, um, what I try to do is to make sure that if I get, let me, a practical example, everybody's interested in a request for proposal that we have published and they're asking for special information. I open it up and I say, you know what? We're gonna have an information session. Everybody that is interested, we're gonna publish the information session. Everybody interested, please come to the information session. 
The idea is to try and navigate, like I'm not saying no to your request. I'm doing this because you asked for it, literally. And then we're gonna have a, an information session on the request for proposal. Then you can all go back now and provide your proposals and we will evaluate. So if you don't get the information, you can ask any questions you want during the information session. But we would make sure, and I'll make sure that we even acknowledge the people who requested for the information session so that you, carry, you kind of feel a sense of, oh, I achieved something I wanted from you. And I think for me, again, the other one I shared is also separating myself and the job and understanding I am not my personality and who I am, shy or otherwise, is not, is not the job. The job requires mo something more than your personality. So I think the one very easily that a lot of women struggle with around communication, you want to just do your work and just be known to do your work and deliver it. But there's a level of communication required. There's a level of projection. There's a level of um, required in public service where you have to let people know what you're doing, not for your sake, but really for the government's sake, for the political party's sake, for advancing the objectives or the agenda of the government that you're working with. And I think that is very important to say. Thank you, Chris. No, I, 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 let me just, just stay with you just for one moment there, because I think it's, a, it's so important that using community, even if you're a shy person, even if you don't think this, I'm not a person who speaks publicly, that, that speaking up and telling people what you're doing and how you're doing it and why you're doing it is important, not just for you, and not just necessarily for the person you're speaking to, but for a, there's a wider audience you're speaking to. And I, I think that's it's such an important piece of advice. Um, do you have, is, there a, is there a moment or an example you can describe when you, you found yourself doing that or when you, when you were speaking to a wider audience on a particular topic? So we normally have, um, so one, one of the things that I find that I, um, we, let me use a local example. So for the Lagos State Employment Trust Fund, we have to engage stakeholders at the grassroots. And I always used to shy away from doing it. I'm not the, I, I always said, oh, no, no, I don't think I have to do it. I don't want to do it. Can we just get a canvasa or somebody who's a professional speaker to do it? But it comes with the office. The expectation is the office does it. So I've had to retrain myself to be able to do it, go with the, for the engagement sessions, have the session, any session that is required because it's your office that they're asking. If you were not sitting in this office, nobody's gonna ask you to have those engagements. So is that reality and the office and the personality and separating it and making sure that you are effective even with the communication and you're doing it properly. Get the training if you have to get the training. So you can also control the, your narrative, which also helps in the long run. That's great. Thank you so much. For, examples are so helpful. That's great. Abina, let me let me turn to you. Can you can you share with us a, a moment when you were you were called upon or you were under some pressure, some expectation of doing something that you felt was wasn't wasn't the right thing by your personal guidance, but um, but it wasn't worth resigning over. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think there are numerous, but I'll share just um, two of them. And um, that starts off from Teju's end, advancing the agenda of government. And so from uh, my, my biography, you can see um, the head for the human trafficking secretariat. And issues of human trafficking are not pleasant areas that every government will be pleased to just be talking about it. If it is in terms of the positive as to what you're doing, number of arrests and all that, it's a good PR. But when it comes to the other side where you are to admit as government that it's happening and of course it's, it's a human rights issue and you have to deal with it, then the challenge comes. And so to really navigate between when you are letting governments upon government understand what it is so that you can also advance the course of fighting it or combating it is one real challenge because it all depends on how the understanding is. And so it's often a matter of a little, you know, tension, but as a civil servant, as a public servant, you have been trained to understand where your neutrality level is, to understand where you are to give a technical advice to the politician or to the government, quote unquote here, 
your job is to ensure what is right need to be done. And so when you get, uh, uh, um, especially a leader or a politician who hardly understand these areas, and they feel it's the other side that it's bringing the integrity of the country down, uh, makes it a little difficult. And if you don't take care, you know, um, like we keep saying, you, you get transferred on that if you don't handle it well. So it takes a lot of tact. It takes a lot of um, self-confidence. It takes a lot of knowing your staff. If you do not learn as a civil servant and understand the terrain you are in, the government you are serving, your purpose has placed there, your duty, then it becomes a problem. You are not the government. You are to ensure the government is having a good image. You are to ensure also you are protecting the very people you are to protect. And so to understand that fine line, which brings me to the second part that I call the self-discourse, where you yourself, you are also discovering yourself. How do others see you? When it comes to integrity, when you ask people about how they see you, you will get shocked about their views and opinions about you. But if you want to be a leader and you do not put certain values and things in place, then forget it, you can't. You can't have everybody praising you and telling you you are all good. Definitely your rules, boundaries and other stuff will step on other people's toes. Especially with the kind of work, you need to be firm where you have to. You need to prosecute where you have to. You need to bring a whole lot of stakeholders together. And so if you do not have certain capabilities, then you'll be, what I say, out of the game. And so how others perceive you, how you perceive yourself, where you want to be, and how you want others to see you play a major role here. But above all, what do you intend to achieve? Becomes the overarching goal. And so then, you have to really understand how to navigate these things. And it takes a lot of skills, competence, and as public officials, you have to understand these things and know what you are about. Then you, you can keep keeping your integrity and your values and standards, and then you keep going, you don't stop. It's great. I think you talk, was talking about um, the, the importance of communicating you're talking, um, you're talking about making sure those you broaden that audience, you bring all those stakeholders. And you're both, you're both, you're both talking about tactics, about ways of approaching that instead of pulling away from the controversy, you move into it and broaden it, and you get more people involved, more public, a wider, a wider audience. And I think it's a very sophisticated but really essential move. And it's hard to do the first time, but once you practice it, once you once you know that's where you have to move, it becomes easier. I think those are it's yeah. great advice, both of you. Rose, can you give us another give, give an example from your from your work? Of, of, is there a story you can tell us or an example you can share where where you were facing one of these kinds of ethical dilemmas? Thank you, Chris. Um, I, I I actually understand. Um, how difficult it is uh, for us in this panel to actually pinpoint one incident. Because Chris, these circumstances and incidents face us every day. Today, I probably had five circumstances or situations that could potentially morph into an integrity situation. Um, but I can tell you um, that uh, having been in the public service for 10 years, I see these moments coming before they turn into what they're meant to turn into. And um, one of the first things I do when I uh, go to a place is actually understand my ecosystem. I understand the rules, I understand the laws, I understand procurement, I understand the interests, the parties, the allies, everything. It is my business to understand who my directors are, who my colleagues are, what, who they, who, you know, how they operate. Um, and I've served in different spaces and I'll give an example um, from uh, uh, my former job which was the Ministry of Education. And when I served as a chief of staff there, um, I recall just being in my office and, and of course I had understood the entire ecosystem and I knew it back to back. Um, and so one of the things that, uh, that happens very quickly is that people don't test you with the big things. They, it's not the $1 billion, $10 billion uh, contracts. It's the, 
you know, it's the 20 pound or $20 um, thing that, you know, somebody walks into the office and they tell you something and um, they sort of gauge it, how, how malleable you are towards that situation. And at the Ministry of Education, of course, I was um, supporting the minister streamline higher education. And so I was going through statements uh, from higher, higher you know, universities and colleges. Um, and, and, and I'm known for being ruthless with detail. I can see detail before in a matter of seconds. So I'm in my office and I'm looking through these documents and I'm, and I'm working on this project. Um, and, and, I, and, I'm, and a young man walks into my office. And there were two actually, there were two young men, they walk into my office and they say, they announce, uh, we want to see who this Rose Washuka is. And I look up and uh, first of all, I'm concerned for my security because I have no idea who these guys are. Um, and they say, we have heard that is, it is impossible to penetrate this place when you're, when you're here or because you're here. Um, and one of the things that you know um, you have to do in the public service is um, even that kind of conversation you have to entertain, it's part of understanding your, your ecosystem. And so I said, yeah, yeah, yeah here I am. Um, are my security guards giving you trouble? Um, are they you know, stopping you from engaging with a public office? And um, the guy actually took out an envelope. It had money and placed it on my desk. And he said, um, look, we just came to appreciate the kind of work you're doing here. Um, and I said, uh, I mean, you can't appreciate me only. So I called, I called in my colleagues into the office. Um, and first of all, they were shocked. They're like, oh, okay, um, what's going on here? Um, and I can tell you that matter ended with an interdiction and a very open, um, integrity process called the Mara Hist. And, but one of the things that you have to know is that that situation could have ended very differently. That situation could have exposed me um, to a, a reputation of somebody who can be bent um, and, be, and be sort of bent to, towards a circumstances of, 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 of you know, not having regard to integrity. And there are many, many, many examples, Chris, but I can tell you that it's usually not the big things. It's not the big money that sinks you. It starts with um, 10 shillings, 20 shillings, 10 pounds. Um, and before you know it, uh, people actually know how much you can bend. And with that goes your values and, and your career um, and the, the entire integrity of the, of the public service. But I, I allow me to mention something small, that the, the circumstances I face every day are not what concerns me because those I can deal with. I know my law, I know my procedure, I am ruthless about corruption and you know, lack of integrity. What bothers me is how society responds uh, to people who actually stand up for integrity and stand up against corruption. Uh, society expects me uh, to appear in a particular way. They expect me to drive a particular car. They expect me to live in a particular way. Um, and when you don't do that, then you get the tag of you're stupid. I've had countless people look me dead in the eye and tell me you are stupid for not playing the game. Um, everyone else is playing it. Why are you not playing it? But um, as, as I will explain later, Chris, there are certain values and leadership for what? Leadership for who? What makes you, what drives you, what makes you wake up every morning? Is it self-gratification or is, that, is it actually service uh, for the public? Um, so it's a very difficult terrain, but it is society that pushes a lot of our leaders to that place because they expect that because you serve in the public service, then in a particular position, then you're supposed to present in a particular way. And they'll tell you to your face that you're nothing and you're worth nothing if you cannot gel into the system. I think it's so important. The pressures here don't just come from the, the people trying to pay a bribe or, the, um, or the, uh, the people who need a favor. The pressures can come from all sorts of unexpected ways. It's often those pressures that are the hardest to counter. I think it, it's, uh, uh, your story reminds me, um, Dr. Yemi Essen, a wonderful woman who's the head of the Nigerian civil service today, um, talks about her own experience starting just as you did about talking about the small things when when she started it, she was a dentist in the um, supervising um, a, a small a small office 
and was expected to sign for um, a consignment of goods that she recognized immediately was substandard, was not what was supposed to be billed. She realized there was corruption at, uh, at play. And she knew she refused to do it. And, and, um, and she said, it probably slowed up my career. There were probably things that small, it was a small test and I didn't do what they were expecting, but people notice. And then when they want somebody of integrity, they turn to you and that's who you wanna be. You wanna be, you wanna be that person who, maybe you, maybe you don't pass that early test. You're shown as someone with integrity. It may slow you up at the very beginning of your career, but you'll develop a reputation that will be, that will be really valuable and allow you to lead with integrity um, as, your, as your career unfolds. So I think those, those early tests that you described, so important, um, really great story. Um, let's, let, me, let me go to uh, uh, Hueda and then, and then we'll open it up for those of you with questions we'll, to anybody on the panel. But Hueda, can you share it? Can you share it? Yeah, sure. I would love to thank Rose, Tej, and Adena for their stories and their, their insights because uh, we all passed by this. Um, I want to add that you choose the leadership style and the integrity from uh, the people you work with. I've been working with so many leaders in the Egyptian government, and I choose the style that I want to be. It doesn't have to be the direct manager that you work with or report to. It has to be the, the right person that you want to follow. And you see the right answers and how he tackles issues of integrity and issues of communication. I totally agree with Rose that understanding the ecosystem and the networking and reading the rules is the core thing. I was put in a situation where I led, uh, I was head of a tender uh, where it was millions and I was uh, the youngest person on the committee, although I'm the head and they were pushing me toward, towards procedures of canceling uh, the tender for the best interest of one of the parties because I read the rules and I know the procedures and I know that if they came late that I can let them in and write it down and write everything. I moved with the tender and I moved I, I, and I controlled the, the, the committee although I was the youngest one because I understand the politics behind everyone, the needs, what they need to, put, to, pre, to present, especially that I'm a woman and they were all uh, men. And this is one of the things that really face us when you lead at a young age and, uh, and, and most of the people around you are not from your background and they will not accept you to have this position. So I made it and I reported to my management and I made sure that these people are set in their positions and I chose the right uh, leadership style with integrity that I want to present. I even uh, teach my, uh, my colleagues and the people I work with small things. You know, when you're in an office and, uh, and you have uh, a paper for the visa that you have to print, okay? And it's not the paper, uh, this paper is not yours. It's uh, for the government paper. But I learned the team to buy some, some stationery that we use for the office instead of the things that we use on the personal level. I teach them that you think of little things more than the bigger things because if you build on little things you will you will make sure that you lose your integrity as you go on uh, also i remember that um with with my networks and the people who loves me i used to have a place in the garage although others they used their um, their positions and their managers and they pushed for for having it i always have a place in my garage even if it's um not my level they keep it for me because I do it with the nicest way, the way I network with them, not that I push them, okay? So it's always about little things, how you do it, how you say it. Uh, it's really hard, again, to fire someone and um, because they're not delivering, because you're the one responsible. I, I'm, I'm a responsible person. I take responsibility towards the, the achievements that I do. I have to face people with their... Uh, Thoughts. I have to take decisions that might affect the career of other people. I have to understand the circumstances that led this person to not to deliver and give him another chance in another department. Then I, I made him leave. Because I have to, every day before I go to sleep, I have to think of all these details. How did I do this? 
what was the, the way and the manner that I talked to this person, how I will impact his life later. He will always remember me, how I did this. Yeah. But it's little things, not only the big things. Yeah, a lot, that's great. I mean, a lot, a lot of the comments we're getting in the in the Q and A are saying these are so, such helpful stories. But can you give us an example? Is there a story you can tell us of a specific time where you you where you were you were you found yourself think, thinking that that night, wondering, did you do the right thing? Did you could you've done it differently? Is there something else you should do the next day? Can you just share share? People are asking for specific examples. Maybe you could share one. Um, it, it was it was recently, as Ross said, it's every day. Plus, I had I had this um, uh, employee that I've been working with for a long time, and I gave him so many chances, uh, even in the appraisal at the end of the year. And um, when it came uh, to the to the moment that I have tell, to tell him that he will he will need to leave, we had a discussion for around two hours, and he was pushing me uh, psychologically to feel that. Uh, I have a problem in communication with him, and it's not the, 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 the quality of work that he's presenting. And he even came into personal things that it's related to my life, and, and he, he said how he supported me in these situations. And I, again, kept my decision. I have to make him leave. He's not contributing to the system. He's, he's, his contribu contribution actually is a burden. So I, I kept remembering the objective of not having him on, in, in, uh, precisely. And I made sure that I delivered for him the message the way I want. I made him leave the, the organization. Yeah. This was one of the things that I, I was thinking about for a lot of time because it really hurts when you, when you, when it, when it, it, when it, it touches the, the person yeah. and he, he tries to push you on the personal level. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. It must, uh, it's, these, these things are never easy, but it makes such a difference to be able to hear them concretely. It's great. Teresa, I don't know um, uh, who's going to be, who's going to, who, who can bring, uh, who can bring some of the voices from our participants in? Um, That's my job, Chris. I will do so. Excellent. Well, first of all, I want to thank you and all the panelists for a fascinating conversation so far. Um, really, really appreciate your um, vulnerability, honesty, and transparency to all of the panelists. Um, there's a question from Amara Oyeka who says, based on what Ms. Rose said about her standing up for herself, can you, how do you differentiate between standing up for your rights at work and being perceived as being rebellious? It's a fine line to walk. How do you do that without being perceived as rebellious? Um. Teresa, can I, uh, can I take that? Can I give my own um, approach to it? I think that uh, as women, especially young women in leadership, we have this great burden of being right or being seen to be right. Obviously, because we are put on a pedestal and everywhere you turn, you're always being judged. And recently, um, as I've grown up, of course, and I, I used to have the burden of being seen as perfect, being seen as great and non-abrasive, non-confrontational. But I've given myself permission to actually stand and exist in my space. And so if you turn around the perception or if you turn around the lens and you ask yourself, um, does, it, does it matter how it makes me feel inside or does it matter how it might make someone feel and it's a guess that I'm making? Um, and I've gone towards, it matters how it makes me feel inside. Because if it makes me feel like I have committed a, an injustice against someone else by rebelling against some truth, um, then I will be able to adjust based on that. Um, and, and Justice Cardozo said that uh, the minds of my men are not tribal because nobody else can read the minds of others. And so it helps. To, to, to spend a bit of time introspecting um, about the kind of values that you have, as opposed to you know, measuring yourself on the scale of society, because that scale is endless. You will never, the digits never stop running. 
Um, and so you have to invent your own scale and measure yourself against your own worth and what you feel is right. So they may call it rebellion. You call it standing up for yourself. They may call it, call it arrogance. You call it firmness. Um, it matters most what you call it. Very good. Oh, thank you very much. Bina, we have a question for you, a quick question. Someone would appreciate the book that you referenced and would like it if you could repeat the name of the book because I think that would be a good resource. Abina, can you uh, tell us the name of that book? And Abina, I think we've got you on mute. Okay, good. Yes. So um, it's um, a book titled 360 Degrees Leadership. Um, it was written by one child, so I've forgotten the same name, but I have it right under my pillow. So I, I, I would speak to um, Laura later if she can share it. But then apart from that, let me join um, on the first question that asked about, as to when are you rebellious and when you not. Let me give um, an example of us in the gender-based violence space. And so we are in an, um, a space where culture is intertwined with, let me say, law. And sometimes cultural values are more stained in society than the law itself. And so you are torn between when you are giving a professional advice where um, society is like, okay, for example, let's say um, issues concerning someone beating the wife and some aspect of religion, culture makes it look like it's okay for you to stay there, keep praying. I mean, God will listen. And you have been trained to see these marks and you are to offer an advice. And so if here the victim is not willing to help, but you have to. And sometimes issues of defilement, you need to go against even religious leaders, traditional leaders to ensure the full regress of the law. And so you become the enemy. And as to when you are really keeping your integrity and being firm, and as to when society have turned against you, become a very big challenge. Sometimes it takes a lot of energy for them to see that the perpetrator is the one at fault and not the victim. And you as an institution, you are in to do just your job, not to take sides. And so these far lines, sometimes you are really seen as rebellious. We've had instances where in my case, People want to travel. They don't want to travel right. You want to stop them. And they see you as being between they getting greener pastures. And so they turn against you. Meanwhile, you know very well you are protecting them. And so sometimes this, yes, you get names. I mean, some will call you Iron Lady. Some will also come and pat you at the back. Well done. But in all this, like I said, you really need to understand the terrain you are in what do you intend to achieve and where you are going? So I'll really give the book title to Laura and Laura can share it later to people, yeah. Wonderful, thank you so much. Here's a question for Teju. Um, Teju, we hear from Janet Munakamwe and the question from her is, what is your take on the claim that leaders are born? How do you think about the difference between nature versus nurture? Um, one of the panelists acknowledged that leadership was only acknowledged later in, uh, in life through support from work colleagues. But do you think that people are born as leaders or can they be developed into leaders? Teju, will you take that one? Okay, great. Thank you, Theresa. I think, to, okay, because of my experience, I would literally say that it's probably not sure, but I've learned and I have seen it that people are also not, people actually grow into being leaders. People learn it. And even, even with nurture, you continue to learn. So one of my biggest um, podcasts, one of, the listen, one of the things I listen to almost every day, they know it's in my house now, How Leaders Lead by David Novak. I'm constantly learning. So you cannot even, I, don't, I, I think the best of it is when you actually recognize it, then you begin to groom it. So there's a learning in even every aspect of leadership. So whether you feel you were born traditionally into a leadership position, because I, I, one of the things I forgot to say to Chris when I talked about my history is that it was, I think it was out of always wanting to fight, always, always fighting to be recognized because I was the fourth child out of five. And I was probably the one 
everybody's not paying attention to. And I wanted the recognition. So I was overcompensating, doing very well, pushing for this, doing that. So I was forced into always wanting to do better than everybody else. But then when you then see that you've done that and you know the day you wanna put your head low, it becomes difficult. So I recognize that. And when you are there and you now are thrown into that limelight, you have to continue to nurture it. You have to continue to groom it. You, it, it doesn't happen to anybody perfectly from day one. I doubt, I really doubt that, but I'm no scientist. But that's my thought on it. Fantastic. Well, let me, if, if I can, Teresa, let me just, as, as, we're, as we're beginning to get towards the end of this hour, I think several of the, several of the comments in the, in the chat and the Q&A are just are, are reinforcing how hard this is, particularly for women. Um, the, on top of all the pressures that anybody would feel, their pressures of family, their pressures of, of, of uh, pressures from home and pressures from other parts of your life that are also um, pushing on you in this role. I wonder if, did, if, you could, if you could each share just something about how you found the people you could talk with about these about these issues, so you weren't having to face them on the, on your own. How who did who did you find, and how did you find them? Um, the the people that you you can work through the 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 tensions because we can't we can't anticipate every challenge all of our hundreds of participants are going to come up against in their lives, but but they'll all need someone someone to work through these with. How did you find yours? Any of you, go ahead, just. Ted, you here, I'll say very quickly, mine, um, I got into a fellowship, the MUJ Fellowship of the Erling Johnson Surly Center, where we have coaches that have gone before us in public service. So we have coaches that are former presidents of not just African countries, but been in public service at the United Nations at different places. And also, you know, even the smaller support systems I have locally, but this are very helpful avenues to workshop issues with sometimes. It yeah. really, really helps because if you're there in leadership, especially in public space, you need a kind of support system that can actually really help you where, where, where you come across something you don't know, you, you're not sure how to deal with. So I found a very, I, found, I find the Amuje Leadership Forum extremely useful for oh. public service. And it's a great story because it, it reinforces that you never, you never, you never outgrow this. You need this at every stage of your career, from the very beginning to even, uh, even when your 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 peers are some of the most celebrated leaders. They still all need someone. This kind of coaching, it's great. I wonder if anybody else want to share just something maybe early in your career how you found Abina. Did you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things, especially with a service that you can't do away with is the hierarchy that exists. And so at every point in time, there's somebody ahead of you and there's somebody below you. And so each of them serve as that mentoring and coaching point. So you know your superior gives to you, you come back, you take solace in your lower level, you discuss the issue, you try to do better. Um, if you have issues, you can also go ahead with your superiors, ask for uh, um, guidance, ask for the way forward. Like we keep saying, communication is the right way to do. You can't do anything on your own. And the other aspect is also getting mentees that you do talk to. So it's a matter of whatever the situation is, it's also a platform to discuss your own self. And they also learning and also understanding the realities ahead of them. Very open discussions. And so it's a matter of give and take. You can't keep things to yourself. You need to always give. And then you can take something out. So that's the little I want to add. I love it. It's really good. Yes. Anybody else before we go back to Teresa? Yeah, Rose, yeah. go ahead. Yes, uh, Chris. Um, one of the things that I have uh, found very useful is listening. Um, because when you listen um, to what is said and what is not said, uh, then you're able to, um, to scan with your right and left brain um, who, you can, who you can go back to to talk about something. And one of the things that I found exceptionally great is to vet your team. Vet your team, um, and especially the people who sit in the back 
um, and sort of fold their arms. And th those are the guys with the experience. Those are the guys who know the organization. Those are the guys who know the pitfalls. Those are the people who see the pits that are being dug for you to, 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 to step into. But in most instances, we leaders, especially we who have um, defied this very um, restrictive you know, career ecosystem that sort of stops uh, young people from getting to those positions, often um, don't turn back. But you always have to look back because some of my greatest advisors um, are young professionals who have been overlooked uh, because they do not feel confident yet to sit at the table. And that you know, presents a really valuable resource because beyond sharing with your family and the people who sort of hold you up, um, you actually need to share these experiences with people who are in the system because they'll be your eyes even when, you're, when you don't see things that have been set up for you or against you. So both of these last, both the two of you have both articulated so powerfully this importance of, of not just looking for people who are your seniors, but looking for those who are coming behind you, who, are, who will consider you their mentor, but their huge sources of advice and guidance and insight for you too. It's a wonderful, it's, a, it's a, such an important lesson. Teresa, what else do we have in the, in the Q&A? We have a question for Haweda. Um, if you could join us back, unmute Haweda. The question for you is, um, oftentimes the voice that women have can be defined by their rank or job grade. What advice would you give to women in lower level positions on how to navigate this? How do you work from a position that's at the bottom of the totem pole? Could you give your views on that? Yeah, sure. You, you take challenges. You see the hardest task and you go for it and you try to do it. You believe in your capabilities. Um, you, you fake it till you make it. Be sure that you can do it. Don't let anyone or anything stop you. Read, read the regulations, read the rules. Ask people for their, exper their experiences. Don't stay in a department that it's not, doesn't have a strategic role in, in the ministry or the public service that you're working with. Look for departments with lots of controversy and lots of challenges. Go for them and ask them to help learn from them. This is how you, uh, you, you turn from a small employee to a manager, to a leader, to a bigger position. It's wow. great. And I think- Can I add a few things, Teresa, to that um, from my very, sister? Very quickly, Rose, and then I think we're, we're, we're coming up yeah. to the end of our hour. You know, do what nobody else wants to do. Photocopy the papers for the presidential meeting, serve the tea, uh, be in the room where groundbreaking conversations are you, you know, going to happen. Work late at night, turn in those briefs at the beginning of your career, do those things because those things give you stamina and they make you know your stuff. At the end of all those things and doing all those things that nobody else wants to do, they rely on you to get the things um, that they need done, done because you've been through the entire system and you know the printers, you know everyone, you have information. So do what nobody else is willing to do. Fantastic. Well, I think the four of you have achieved almost the impossible. You are both inspiring and relatable. And it's one of the hardest things to do. Um, I think this is great advice. And I think we could co on, we could keep this conversation going for hours, but uh, we don't have hours. In fact, we're at the end of our time. So with huge thanks to all four of you, Teresa, back to you. Well, thank you to our four panelists who Chris has very appropriately thanked for the important contributions you've made to women across the continent, women who are with us on Zoom and those who are also joining us live stream on Facebook. We have people from pretty much every country on the continent and many who are working in foreign service around the world who are also listening to these wise words of wisdom. Chris, thank you for shaping this conversation and for being with us today. We really appreciate your contribution to this. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Teresa, for doing this. And thanks to all. Wonderful. And now we're going to move to Patricia Obuzua, the Vice President of Public Affairs at Coca-Cola. Patricia is someone who I also am privileged to call a friend. I have known her for many years and watched her manage her own career. Patricia hails from Nigeria. 
She got her first degree in accounting. She went on from that and studied as well at Oxford University at the Said Business School. She started her career with her love for art. She was an assistant curator at an African art gallery and she also worked for the British Council doing arts and sponsorship manager role. And then she started in the world of public affairs for some of the world's largest corporations. And she's worked her way up to the very top, the pinnacle of all of these positions being the head of public affairs at one of the biggest brands known throughout the world and that is Coca-Cola Africa. We've been privileged to work with Patricia as we've shaped this particular program here today, training for women early in their public affairs career, I'm sorry, public public service careers, and with the um, overall, par overall partnership that we're working on together with Coca-Cola, the Women Heads of State Initiative. In Patricia's current role as the Vice President of Public Affairs, she manages relationships with governments in all 54 countries across the continent of Africa. And in doing so, she has an opportunity to engage with women just like you, across the continent. And through the many years in which she's been doing this, she's had an opportunity to see women rise from the lower levels up to the highest levels. And so she's gonna take all of her personal experience as well as what she has observed in her vast roles and share that advice with you on how to kickstart your career in public affairs. Patricia, can I turn it over to you now? Thank you, uh, Teresa, for that wonderful introduction. And I have five minutes to speak. So it's gonna be a very quick advice sharing, but I have to um, acknowledge um, Her Excellency Prime Minister, Sarah Kugo Genwa Amadila for being here. I think she's still here because I see yes, it on yes. the screen. Um, Chris Stone, that was a wonderful session with um, Abena Teju, Rose and Hawaii and I'm looking forward to um, Gori Paint's um, session. So I, I had some remarks that I prepared earlier. A lot of it is redundant. It's been such a wonderful session and um, I've been privileged to watch Tedro Abisoye grow very quickly in her career and I hope I'll have the privilege to meet every other person. Actually, I'm going to insist on meeting every single one of you, Adena, Rose, Hawaii, when I visit your countries. And I am um, delighted at this opportunity to contribute to such an important topic. And let me thank Teresa and Africa.com. Thank you for your partnership. It's been wonderful. So um, working for Coca-Cola, let me start by saying that we are committed. We are committed to empowering women. And it's right from the top. We have a commitment or a huge ambition that by 2030, we'll have 50% of our leadership positions occupied by women. In Africa, we're already doing much better. We're already at 55% occupied by women, but then that mirrors what we see in public service in Africa as well. It looks like we're doing pretty good globally. I know that there are different aspects of it that we might not be satisfied with, and um, Prime Minister Medela was um, right to say that we have, you know, still some ways to go. But what I, when I look at um, South Africa, and we have 44% of the MPs being women. I see Rwanda with 61%, 50% of the ministers are women as well. I see women in public, African women in public positions like Ngozi um, Okunjo Iwela at the World Trade Organization. And then look at the fact that we've had 22 women heads of state. So the point I'm trying to make is it's attractive, very attractive. And then when I see people like Abena Teju, Rose and Huayda speaking, it shows me how come we're achieving these things. And for me, it's, um, it's three things. And some of them, a lot of these points have been made already and some will still be made. The first thing for me with kickstarting a career, and I'm not an expert on public um, on the public sector. I have been in the corporate sector, and when I hear everyone speak, it strikes me more and more just how much in common we have. It's the same principles that make you succeed. 
And um, for me, it's three things. The first is um, in the first is to set a high standard for yourself in kickstarting your career. And Rose said it best. You know, look for look for what nobody else is doing. Find a way to stand out. Set a high standard for yourself. Look at what's expected and then add some more. In the course of my career, it's the only way I've grown, I have to say. I have my job description, and then I look at fulfilling that job description. But what else is there in demand? What else can I offer that's going to give me that leg up and get me to stand out and be seen to be able to take on additional responsibility? The second, I would say, is never lower that standard. So you set the standard, but don't take it lower than you set it. And that's where I find a lot of people make a mistake in kickstarting their career. So you know that you want to, be, to achieve great things. You know you want to be seen as achieving great things. And Tedju Abiso said, um, said it best. You want to not just do, but you want to be seen doing, and not just for yourself, but for the fact that you're helping advance the agenda of whatever organization you're working for. So it's much, making sure that you never lower that standard. And I learned it very early on in my career through, um, I mean, it, the, the lessons you learn from little experiences. When I was younger in my career, I went for, I was nominated to attend, um, I was nominated to attend a women's leadership program in Geneva. I think it was called Women in Leadership. And I went to this program and there was someone else from the company I was working for, I was working for Potter & Gamble at the time. And she uh, held another position in the US. She wasn't my boss but she was in quite a senior position, not at the top. But we arranged to meet for lunch and I came 10 minutes late. You know, I was doing this African time thing. I was quite young in my career. I thought, oh, it's just lunch and it's just, you know, it's not my boss or anything. And it was an important lesson for me when I met her. She was very gracious, very pleasant, but she pointed out to me that if she was in a place and they were thinking of someone reliable from Africa, and they wanted her to nominate somebody, she wouldn't think of nominating me because she knew that she couldn't rely on me to get to lunch at the time that we both agreed. It's, it, it's, at this point, I was thinking of it as lunch and someone that wasn't my boss, but it was an important lesson that took me through. And I started to observe and started to make sure that I was consistent. So it's not just when you're with the boss, it's, in what you do. When I listen to the speakers from the earlier session, that's something that all of them had in common. They're dedicated to maintaining a high standard and they're doing it at every opportunity. Now, I don't have a lot of time to speak. The third one is the one I'm almost going to say is redundant because the third is always act with utmost integrity. But that's what the last session was about. It's not a surprise that these women have risen to where they are in their careers because part of the reason is clearly because they have integrity at the core of what they're doing. And that's not an easy thing in public service. As Teresa mentioned, I've dealt with governments across Africa. I've been doing this for many years. It makes you stand out. Um, I think Crystal mentioned that as well. It may make it harder for you at an earlier stage, but you get known for sticking to your guns and acting with integrity and people start looking up to you when they want someone they can trust. There's not much more I have to say. I wanted to leave you with those um, little pieces. Thanks to all the speakers. Thanks to Teresa and Africa.com for your partnership. And, um, and thanks a lot for having me. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your remarks, Patricia. You're someone who has lived with principles and reaped the benefits in your successful career for having lived through all that you say. You don't just walk the walk, talk the talk, you have walked the walk. Thank you. Well, we, we are delighted that the Prime Minister is back in the room with us again. She's actually left Parliament in Namibia to come join us. We are very, very privileged to have you share so much of your time with us, but we know that you do that because of your commitment to young women, to young women in public service, not only in your country of Namibia, but across the African continent. And we are very grateful to you for your continued, this is the third time you've been with us. If we count today, it's twice in one day. So maybe we'll count this four times you've been with us. Um, I'm going to pose a question 
that um, was put out to you earlier. And the question is, how do you, in your very, very high level, women at far lower levels are on this call, they want to know, how can you, as a woman with a leading role in government, manage your family life and your work balance? How do you do this? Yes, thank you very much, Ms. Clark. Uh, I apologize that I was not able to sit through the session today. I very much wanted to do so but there were other pressing priorities here at home. I'm happy that I'm able to join still because it's arranged online. And how do I manage to, to balance uh, between a career and a family life? I would say that I'm fortunate to have had role models. My own mother was a career lady. During a very difficult period when our country was under colonization by apartheid South Africa, and uh, we were subjected to the worst form of brutality that one can ever imagine. So she worked as a headmistress of the village primary school, and she worked on our, our subsystems farming plot at home. And she served as, a, as head of the household because our father was away on contract labor. And uh, for me, juggling between being a family person, a lady and a head of a family and a career person, was natural. I actually didn't think that it was an exception. I didn't think that there were situations different from what I was experiencing. So it came naturally. Then I joined the liberation struggle and I saw women there being soldiers. They leave behind their husbands and their children to partake in combat and they came back. So I was fortunate enough that I started working in an independent country where the workers' rights are protected and the government is caring and I have an income and I'm able to find somebody to help look after my children or to take them to daycare so that I can jungle between the family and, and work. But I think what is also most important is when you are passionate about what you do, you actually do not feel the burden. You may feel the physical exhaustion, but the, the, the joy of, of being a mother, the love that you get from your children, the, the, the gratification that you get from your work, when you are able to make an impact into people's lives, make you forget about you know, the efforts that you have to put in and, and how much it takes away from you in, in terms of energy. So my advice is love what you do, be passionate, choose what you are passionate about. Once you are passionate and you are committed, everything will fall in place. Wonderful. Do you have time for us to ask you one last question? Yes. Okay, we'll ask you one more question. As you know, today our audience, our participants are women who are in the early stages of their careers in government at the opposite end of the spectrum to where you sit. And one of the questions we've asked this, this conversation has occurred in the last panel, but I'd like to put it out to you as the prime minister. Often the voice in government is defined by your rank and job grade. How do you give, what advice do you give to women who are in the lower levels on how to have a voice beyond the one that they are confined to having by being subject to being in a lower ranking position? How do they rise above that and have an impact greater than a low level positioning? Yes, I always say that leadership is never about the position that you occupy. You can be a leader simply because you are able to inspire others. You are able to influence situations. And the women naturally are leaders because they take care of everyone at home. That already puts them in a leadership position. So if you can master what you do, if you can put everything in what you do, if you can try to be impactful, then you are able to influence decisions even from a low position that you, are, you, you, you find yourself. And that would make other people to value you. It would also give you the confidence and the satisfaction when you see the impact that you are able to, to make. So, and we also observe that during the COVID pandemic, when we had, for example, frontline front line workers, like police officers, uh, nurses doing, work really in a very hazardous environment, but also being impactful in the, in the lives of people. People started to appreciate the things that people do in spite of the positions being low that these persons are occupying. And they, for the first time you hear people who would otherwise 
for example, not respect civil servants because it's believed that they don't work that hard. People would prefer not to go to state hospitals and would prefer to go to the private hospitals. But when COVID came and we had so many cases, we saw that people were actually preferring to go to state hospitals. And for the first time, they were starting to respect these nurses whom they used to call lazy and ill-mannered. And they are now leaving notes thanking them. And the nurses are feeling appreciated. And I believe also that some of the practitioners in the private sector were noting that those that were working in the public sector, for example, seem to be more prepared because they are not working in an environment that is highly resourced. So they were innovative. They know how to achieve more with less. They know how to innovate. They know how to, to, to change gears when different circumstances arise. And now they are being valued more as they look for greener pastures outside. So value what you have and, and continue to, to develop it and grow it. Others would appreciate you for it. And it can also open doors for you to, to progress higher. Well, wise words from a woman head of state. We thank you very, very much. Head of government. You always want to make me make sure I say that properly. Yes, yes. <laughs> correct me. So I'm going to correct myself before you correct me. From a woman head of government of the country of Namibia. We thank you for your, your commitment. We really do appreciate your commitment to the young women who are with us today. And I know you have extraordinary demands on you and you've left parliament to come back and see us again. I can't thank you enough for that commitment. Thank you so much. You inspire us all by your commitment. You, you go out of your way to make sure that you push these issues that have to do women in their service to communities and their empowerment. Thank you very much for arranging this once more. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I tell you, we're having a fantastic day, or at least that's what it seems like to me. And I hope that all of the women who are participating today have taken something from these many, many experts who have walked the path that you are on. We're going to shift gears now, and we're going to go to our final session, another one that I am really looking forward to. Um, this session is going to be led by someone else who I consider a friend, um, and that is Gorik Ng. I was introduced to Gorik through another organization. Uh, we actually have not met in person. It's one of the interesting dynamics of the uh, pandemic era is that you can actually make friends virtually. And, um, and I feel that that's what has happened with Gorek. When we started to do this work around women in Africa, um, Black women in Africa, you know, the question is, you know, how did you find an Asian guy from America? But I was told that he was fantastic and that after we did work with him, no one would care. And so this is the second time that we have worked with him. And that is certainly the case. Gorik comes to us with an extraordinary background. Gorik comes from a very modest beginnings himself. His mother was a domestic worker, single mom. He helped his single mom when he was growing up. He helped clean toilets with her when he was in high school. And then he was accepted at Harvard College. He went on from Harvard College to Harvard Business School. And he went on to work in some of the most prestigious private sector global organizations in the world. And what he found was that there was a gap between what was expected of him and what he actually knew. He re recognized that other people had been raised in environments where they were given clues about how to perform in the workplace. They had been, these lessons had been steeped in them at home, around the dinner table, but he didn't have the benefit. And so he used his incredible insights to think about this profoundly and to write a book that looks at those gaps and advises people from humble beginnings on how to be successful in the workplace if this wasn't obvious to you when you started. Um, Gorek, I find to be an incredibly engaging uh, panelist, uh, leader of a panel, I should say, a moderator and has a number of very specific tactics that you can use to help advance your career in public service. Very specific and tactical ways that you can stand out and help to advance your career. And so this is very practical advice, very actionable. And I promise that when you finish this session, 
you're going to walk away with an action plan on what you're going to do when you get to work tomorrow morning that's different from what you did today, all with the goal of knowing that these very effective tactics will help to distinguish you and help you to be picked out from among the ranks in order to advance your career. So with no further ado, I'm going to push, uh, turn this over to my friend and our leader for the final session of today, Gorik Ng. Teresa, thank you so much for the incredibly generous and kind introduction. And to Deborah and Laura and the entire Africa.com team, thank you so much for this incredible program. To Madam Prime Minister Kugongelwa Amadila, thank you for being an inspiration to all of us and to Patricia and Dr. Stone and to all the panelists who've preceded me. It's been an incredible program and it's truly a privilege for me to be with you all today. Today, I'm going to share with you a topic that is near and dear to my heart, and it is on how to navigate what I call the unspoken rules of the workplace. And today's session is going to be called how to stand out as a public servant and rise to what I call level seven leadership. Let's dive right in. Our agenda today will be split up into three sections. For the first 45 minutes, I will share some of the key takeaways from my research. For the second part, I will spend with an esteemed array of trailblazing women in public service as part of a panel. And then for the last portion, we would love to hear from all of you. And so for this last part, please use the Zoom Q&A feature to ask questions. And I would encourage you all to use this feature to ask your questions all throughout this program. We're going to go through as many of these questions as we can in this program. And I definitely look forward to hearing from you all. So with that, let's go. First, given there's just so many incredible women with us today from all across the African continent and beyond, I would love to see who is with us today. And I would love to hear from all of you about which country you are all from. If you are on a smartphone, please aim it at this QR code and it will open up to a page on polleverywhere.com. If you're on a computer, you can also go open up a new browser tab and type in p-o-l-l-e-v dot c-o-m slash Gorik, G-O-R-I-C-K. So once again, please open up your smartphone, aim your camera app at this QR code or type in polyv.com slash Gorik and share with us where you are coming from today. I'm going to give you all a moment to scan this QR code and then I'll advance to the next slide where we can start seeing just what a diversity of voices and talent that we have here around this virtual room. Just because I can't help myself, I'm going to advance to the next slide here where we are going to start seeing a word cloud of where you all are from. And I can see that many of you are hopping right on already. I'm seeing many folks from Kenya, from Nigeria, from South Africa, from Zimbabwe, from Ghana, from Egypt, from Sierra Leone, from Ireland, from Lagos, from Uganda, from Zambia, from Belgium, from Canada. Wonderful to see this global audience here today. And I will say that I myself am actually in Botswana at the moment. So it's incredible to be with you all, both virtually and for those of you on the African continent right now, physically here in this virtual space. I'm seeing folks from Ethiopia. I'm seeing folks from Cote d'Ivoire from the United Kingdom, from Poland, from Burkina Faso, from Libya, from Austria. Incredible to just see the, the range of, of geographies represented here. And as a result, the diversity of voices and the diversity of of talent and of perspectives. 
And all of you will not only have a voice and a seat at the table now, but I hope that many of you in this room today will be the future leaders that will bring us into the future. Angola, Philadelphia, from the United States, from Rwanda, from Mozambique. Just incredible to see the, the word cloud here. Please continue to add in your country and just seeing the array of voices here just gives me so much energy for the program ahead. So thank you so much. And I would like for all of you to keep that browser tab open because we're going to have a number of polls in the session today. So please keep it open and we will return to it shortly. Now I wanna start off with my first performance appraisal when I transitioned from education to employment. My performance appraisal said something like this. Gorick needs to fully own his work, including going through the painstaking preparation of taking over a colleague's project. Now, when I received this performance appraisal, it seemed rather straightforward until I went word by word. And I noticed that there was this concept called ownership that while short, just three letters long was something that I didn't have a clue what it meant. And it was actually this curiosity that led to me conducting this research, which I will share with you in this session. But before I move forward, I'm curious to hear from all of you. Have you ever received a performance appraisal in your public sector career? We're seeing here on the screen already a bar chart where I'm seeing approximately, and of course, as you're all contributing, we're seeing this update in real time where we have about 80% of you receiving a performance appraisal and about 20% of you not receiving a performance appraisal. When I did this research, what I realized is, whereas in school, we would have marks and grades and report cards and a transcript. And how we are performing is written at the very top of every assignment. Whereas in the workplace, and especially in the public sector, and depending on where you are, in which ministry, in which country, in which jurisdiction, your ability to discern how you are doing on a day-to-day -day basis and whether you are on track to becoming the leader and professional that you have the potential to become is opaque. It's not shared, it's trapped within the, 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 the brains of your supervisors and those around you. And so I'm seeing that almost 30% of you actually never receive a performance appraisal, which can be an opportunity to create a blind spot in your career. Now, I want to hear now from the approximately 75% of you who have received a performance appraisal in your career. And I would love for you to stay on that pollev.com slash Gorick page. And I would like for you to type a few words, a short phrase to explain if you received a performance appraisal, what did your supervisor say was your biggest area for improvement? And I'm seeing someone here already saying none, not receiving any feedback. Another individual saying that they need to brush up on their writing skills. Another saying communication. Another saying the ability to multitask, to work in a team, to communicate. We're seeing a pattern already. Whether it's on the one hand, receiving feedback on communication skills or the ability to delegate or the ability to manage one's time to the other end of the spectrum of not receiving any feedback at all. And we're seeing that here once again. Sometimes it's interpersonal skills to speak up more. Other times it's none at all. And for those of you who have received feedback and you're seeing others receive the same feedback that you may have gotten earlier in your career, my intent behind this poll is to let you know that you are not alone. And for those of you who may not have received any feedback, I want you to know that one, you also are not alone, but you could perhaps learn from those who've come before you, the talented women around this virtual room today, that communication skills are one of the top challenges that they face in the workplace, at least in the eyes of other people. And of course, some of us have, uh, I'm seeing here on the screen, never worked for public service, but I welcome your participation here in the session nevertheless, prioritizing, delegating, 
becoming more visible in the organization after only three months of employment, time management. I appreciate all of you contributing your, your feedback here. We are starting to see a great deal of, a great de deal of similarity between the, the responses. So I'm going to go ahead and skip forward and move on to some of this content in my presentation, which I hope will address many of the feedback that you have received in your professional career so far. So why did I share all of this? Well, it's because when I started my research and really what inspired this research in the first place was an observation. I observed in the US alone, 4 million young people transitioning from education to employment every year. And despite the 16 plus years that they may have spent in school as part of their undergraduate education, for example, they are starting once again at square one. But while they're standing on square one may be temporary, a divergence begins almost immediately. Where on the first day, I see someone knowing someone in the organization, another person not knowing anyone at all. I see one person being pulled into an important meeting. The other person not knowing that this meeting was even happening in the room next door. One person having the confidence and the awareness of priorities to be able to speak up in this meeting. The other person, even if they were invited, staying quiet. And I saw that in one of the poll results earlier. One person signing up for a higher profile project and being invited to that project. Another person putting their head down, doing hard work, but not receiving the same level of visibility and recognition. And I started seeing this pattern over and over and over again over the course of weeks and months and years until I saw the end state where someone, person A in this case, is respected by their peers, receives more important responsibilities and makes an impact, which I know all of you are so passionate about doing in public service. On the other hand, person B ends up in a very different situation. In fact, the opposite situation. They struggle, they don't make an impact, they quit. And there is a common term known as the glass ceiling. Well, what I see from my research is it's not about bumping your head up against the glass ceiling, just minutes or moments away from that high level position. I see everyday frictions that prevent one person from getting ahead compared to another, that prevents them from getting even close to bumping their heads up against that so-called glass ceiling which raised a single question in my mind, which is what separates those who make an impact from those who stumble in their professional careers? And this single question led to me interviewing over 500 professionals across geographies, industries, and job types, including on the African continent, and including many women uh, across their career stages. And over the course of these interviews, I came upon a certain pattern. And I wanna share this pattern with you through the story of Elizabeth, who is a career trailblazer that we will be hearing from shortly in this program as part of this panel. What I saw was a starting point, which many of you can likely relate to, which is that Elizabeth entered the civil service and human resources after university. Fast forward, and she was awarded the best performing director by the head of the civil service. Now, when I saw her go from point A to point B, I started wondering, how did she go from here to here? It was a big black box. And to her peers and colleagues, it was a big mystery. However, over the course of interviewing her and so many other trailblazers who come before you, I started realizing that there's a certain set of steps that Elizabeth and others have done to get further, faster in their careers. What did she do? Well, first, she showed up to work on time or in Elizabeth's case, early, and completed her assignments fully, accurately, and promptly. Now, you might see this and think, well, that feels like common sense. And when I saw this, I too thought it was common sense because I thought that this would be enough to get her promoted, making an impact, and being recognized. However, I started realizing over the course of getting to know Elizabeth that that was only one of many steps. After doing her work fully, accurately, and promptly, she learned that many civil servants were actually frustrated by the inconsistent and slow promotion process in civil service. 
At which point she thought, well, duh, of course this is a, com a common complaint because there isn't a standard process by which promotions are even decided. And so she joined a team to draft a scheme of service to standardize promotions. She navigated the bureaucracy and the politics of getting this document approved. And she ended up implementing the scheme of service across the civil service to recruit candidates across the public sector. Before long, she got promoted to director to oversee the civil services performance management system as well. And over the course of this, she got recognized, she was seen and heard, and she was awarded best performing director by the head of the civil service. Now, I'm oversimplifying here and we're going to hear Elizabeth's story shortly, but I want you to know that success is not linear, of course. I don't wanna be unrealistic. But even though each of us will have volatility, ups and downs in our careers over the course of every day, week, month, year, maybe even years, the question is how can you position yourself onto this path, this upward trajectory, instead of this path, this downward trajectory? And so what separates those who make an impact from those who stumble? It's this ability to think like a leader. And it's in chapter eight of my book, The Unspoken Rules, on take ownership. It's the ability to think as if they led the organization or maybe even the country. Now, what is leadership or ownership? When we take a look at so many of the role models that we have on the African continent, we realize that it's actually the mindset of being in the head of state seat rather than a constituent seat in everything that you do, regardless of what position you may hold. So what will it take to get into this leadership and ownership mindset? Well, it's two steps. Two steps that Elizabeth and others have taken. And one, it begins with reframing your role, regardless of what your role may be. And number two is to lead no matter where you are and what position you hold. What does this look like? Let's dive right in. What does it look like to reframe your role? Well, I, when I interview professionals in public service and also in the private sector, and especially women, I hear the word just used a lot. Here, for example, I just answer the phone. Well, that may be true. You do answer the phone as part of your job, but there's a reframing that can occur as well, which is that you aren't just answering the phone. You're the ears of this department, of this ministry, perhaps of this public official, perhaps knowing more than others do of what is going on and what the priorities are. And so as a result, what is trapped in your head are insights into what constituents and partners need and want better than anybody. So yes, you do answer the phone, but you're the ears. And in turn, you have insight, you have information, you have knowledge, you have wisdom that can be useful to other people and to the many people that you serve. Here's another example. I hear, I just write memos. And we all know in public service, memos are a common, common piece of work. Well, yes, you do write memos, but what is the end goal? It's to develop policy. And over the course of developing policy, you understand why legislation is the way it is better than anybody. And if you're researching as part of this policymaking process, you understand the issues, the many facets of this issue better than anybody. And you too have wisdom that can be useful to the public sector, to your constituents that you serve. One more, I just schedule meetings. That can be reframed to I keep this ministry running. I keep this team running. I keep this department running. I keep this government running. And over the course of your work, you understand how to get things done better than anybody. You know who to go to. You know how to navigate the politics and the bureaucracy. You know who to go to, who to say what to, in what time, at what sequence. This is information that no one else has but you. So I want you to now take a moment and think about the work that you do on a daily basis. And I want you to open up that pollev.com slash Goric link. I hope you still have it open. There's going to be more polls to come. But I want you to take a chance and reframe your role using the structure. I do blank, which really means I do blank. So I'll give you an example here. I read resumes. Perhaps you are in human resources, you're a recruiter in talent acquisition. Yes, you do read resumes, but it really means that you decide who works here? So take a moment, think about the daily work that you do. Think about maybe one task 
where you might find yourself thinking, I just do this and reframe it. I'm excited to see who says what. I see someone here saying, I decide who gets funds. So perhaps this is an individual who assesses applications as part of programs and, and grants and funding. I manage projects, but it really means I create jobs. I love that. I determine our level of revenue generation. Incredible. I decide who gets the bid. So I see someone perhaps from procurement, from sourcing, I decide who gets the tender. I attend to distress calls, hugely important. I draft the training plan of my colleagues. So I decide who gets trained. I manage talent. Yes, it does work for the person who put test in the link. This is not an easy task because when I explain my work to folks, I often think, well, I just attend meetings or I just look at Excel spreadsheets or I just draft presentations or I just schedule meetings, one of, that exam one of those examples that I shared earlier. But as you can see, there's a higher level of impact that you are all making on a daily basis that is worth reminding yourself because each and every one of you is performing a critical function for your constituents, for your country, for society at large. And I know this is a, a not an easy exercise. So if you don't have the time right now to type it out, I would encourage all of you to think about what this looks like long after your, the, the session here today. All right, so I want to now go ahead and take a pause, see who else would like to enter in their information. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and advance to the next slide. All right, seeing no one else, I'm gonna go ahead and move forward. But again, take this with you because it's the first step to thinking at that higher level, something that all of you are able and have the potential to do. So why does this matter? It's because when I take a step back from Elizabeth's story and those of others, what I used to think and what I often hear from early career professionals is to make an impact, to get ahead. It's all about doing your job well. That mindset that I imported into the workplace. But it turns out that what I now think after interviewing folks like Elizabeth and what I want you to remember is that it's about doing your job well, yes, but it's also about demonstrating that you can be trusted with more important responsibilities. In the private sector, there is a framework called the nine box matrix. Along the bottom are low performance, medium performance, and high performance. And along the side is low potential, medium potential, and high potential. Performance is really code word for reliability. How much do I trust that you will do what you say you will do? And then performance is about promotability. How confident am I that you are ready and capable to perform at that higher level? So what does reliability mean? It means that you are responsive, that you're organized, that you're detail-oriented, that you're professional, that you're reliable. And I saw time management as being one of those key skills that a number of you have been asked to, to develop further. And I hope that this session will help you do this, just that. But what I realized was it's actually not enough to just accomplish these five things. You also need to show potential. That means that you know why you're doing what you're doing. So it's not just about putting your head down, following directions and doing your homework as if you were in school, but it's about think at that higher level. It's about having an answer and a point of view. I saw someone earlier say that they needed to be more vocal in meetings. This is what number two is all about. There's addressing problems and questions before they arise. So not just reacting, but being proactive, not just keeping up, but stepping up. Number four is being on top of the latest developments. So also not just putting your head down, but being aware of what others are working on, what trends there are out there in the world, 
what perhaps other departments, other teams are doing, what is the latest news and trends and developments in the media. And then finally, number five, something that I heard from a lot of you is to be seen and heard by leadership. So not just doing your job, but being known for doing a good job. Now, what I see among so many people who have potential but aren't demonstrating it is that they're focusing a lot on performance, which leads many leaders to think, well, you're so great at this job. Why don't we keep you here and have you perhaps train other people? Instead, seeing you as a future leader, someone who is capable and deserving and eager to have those more important responsibilities. So you wanna be as close to the top right-hand quadrant as you possibly can, not the bottom left-hand corner. But it begins with being reliable, showing performance, and then moving here, showing potential. Now the challenge, and we're gonna talk about this as well during the panel, is that just because you are competent doesn't necessarily mean that others see you as competent. Just because you are committed doesn't mean that others perceive you as committed. And here we get into a lot of bias, which unfortunately is something that women are especially facing in the workplace. Gender being a source or a means by which others express bias, Ethnicity is another one, class, socioeconomic background, sex, sexual orientation, your ability or disability, whether it's diagnosed or undiagnosed, your religion, your age, your language, your nationality, your vocal pitch, how you speak, access to transportation. If there are events that happen at night or that are far away from where you live, your physical appearance, your family commitments, something that Madam Prime Minister had spoken about earlier, your degree of introversion and extroversion, your educational background, perhaps where you graduated from your studies, and then societal expectations for what someone like you should be doing in the workplace. So I don't wanna frame all of this as a matter of self-help because when I think about the divergence between person A and person B, this divergence here, there's you and there's other people. And how you see yourself will contribute to how you conduct yourself. And how others treat you will be influenced by how others see you. So speaking up is easy to say, but very hard to do if there is that internal dialogue that is suppressing your good ideas. And it's also not helpful when others perhaps see you as someone who isn't speaking up or isn't capable of speaking up or doesn't have ideas to share. So I don't wanna frame this as purely about self-help. It's really about we all needing to help. This includes senior leadership. It includes your supervisor and maybe the biases that they may have. But setting the stage in this way, I want you to now take some tangible next steps away that you can apply tomorrow. And this means leading no matter where you are. So what does this look like? Well, when I start thinking about what it takes, it means going from executing, following the instructions to strategizing. It means asking questions to suggesting ideas. It means gathering information and doing research to synthesizing, to collecting all of this data together, asking the question of why is this even important? And then sharing those higher level takeaways and recommendations. It means following in meetings and staying quiet to steering the conversation, or if it's not steering the conversation, it's at least contributing to the conversation. This means A plus B plus C plus D. And this is a framework that I call level seven ownership or level seven leadership. So let's go into detail on what it looks like to strategize, suggest, synthesize, and steer. In four situations that you will all find at work on a daily basis. Number one, or rather A, is when you're tasked with a project. B is when you have a question. C is when you're researching something. And D is when you are in meetings. And I can graph this out with 
a Y and an X axis, where along one axis we have ownership and on the other axis we have impact. So let's talk about when you're tasked with a project, when your supervisor comes up to you and gives you an assignment. Now, level one is to dismiss. And I know that all of you in spending this time with me here today to develop your careers aren't at level one. But you all probably know, as I do, those people at work who say, well, that's not my job. Talk to so-and-so instead, who deflect rather than embrace, who, well, dismiss rather than do. Now, the second is something that I did a lot of, which is smile and nod. So when my supervisor would come up to me with a project and assignment, I would think to myself, I don't exactly know what is going on right now, but I don't want to come across as if I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm going to say, sounds good. And maybe I'll try and figure it out later. And hopefully I'll figure it out. But nine out of 10 times, I would have no idea what's, do what's going on. So I would end up doing the wrong work, doing it the wrong way, or not doing it on time. Now, I realize later on that this is actually the mindset that we come into the workplace with from school. Because in school, as you all may remember, the teacher knows best. And so if there is a test, there is a right answer. And your grade is very easily discernible. Whereas in the workplace, it's so much more difficult to know if there's even a right answer. And in so many of these tricky policy issues that you'll be touching and are touching, there is no right answer. It's a battle of ideas. So what's level three? It means clarifying. So saying, I'd love to see how I can help. Help me understand this. Level four is contemplating. So saying, can you help me understand this? And then thinking about what the other person is saying and then saying, okay, well, what about this? Level five means suggesting. It means doing all the above. Can you help me understand this? Okay, what about this? And then going a step beyond and saying, well, would it be helpful if we tried this as well or instead? And then number six is doing exactly all of the above as well as saying, sounds good. What I can do next is this. How does that sound? So you're taking a conversation, turning it into a proposal and then suggesting a next step. And then finally, level seven is actually managing the process and saying all of the above as well as saying, great, Based on this, it sounds like I will need to speak with this individual. I don't think I am connected to them yet. Would you happen to be able to make an introduction or should I reach out to them myself? So all of this means going from just following instructions as we're taught in school to strategizing, to putting ourselves in the shoes of the manager, the leader of this project, of this broader objective and asking ourselves, why is this even being asked of me in the first place? Rather than taking what others are asking of us for granted. Now, I hope all of you are still on polev.com because I would love to hear from you. When it comes to taking on work, what level are you at? And for those of you who have your tabs open already, you will be able to see that the, the page updates. So I'm gonna go back one slide so you can all see where you are. I want you to just take a moment here and ask yourself, what level do I think I am at the moment? And for those of you who are not yet in the workforce, think about in a prior internship, in a prior job that you may have had, how did you interact with your supervisor? How did you interact with your colleagues? And I'm curious here on the next slide, I'm seeing a lot of engagement. This is incredible to see the bar charts. I'm gonna go back in time and go back to the slide here. Once again, ask yourself and be honest, you'll see in the poll everywhere, you can skip the question that asks your name. No one needs to know where you think you are. Are you on level one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven? And I'm just in the interest of time going to skip ahead here and take a look at the poll I'm seeing most of you, or at least the plurality of you, 25% of you at level five, 20% of you at level four, 17% of you at level three, some of you incredibly at, at level seven already. Now I frame all of this to you all as really almost the equivalent of learning anything, learning an instrument, learning to sing, learning to dance, learning a language. If you are in level 
three French, well, here's your chance to get to level four French. If you're in level four French, here's your chance to level five French. And for those of you who are higher up than perhaps your coworkers, here's your chance to take a mentorship role and to pay it forward to help someone else climb this ladder of leadership. So no matter where you are, there's room for improvement and or there is room to pay it forward. And in doing so, showing your potential as well. Now let's go ahead and move on to B, which is when you have questions. This is one of the most common questions I get in the workplace, which is how do I ask questions at work without looking lazy or incompetent? Well, how do you do this? Level one is to not clarify at all, and I'm guilty of doing this, which is to smile and nod and assume that you'll be able to figure it out. Level two is to ask open-ended questions and to say, I noticed this, or I'm doing research on this. I couldn't find this information. What do I do next? Or I'm trying to contact this individual. They're not responding. What do I do next? Now, I thought, just like in Elizabeth's story, that this was going to be enough because this is how we ask questions in our daily lives. It's how we ask questions in school, but it's only level two. Level three is to turn that open-ended question into a multiple choice question. So to say, I noticed that this other department is sending this in response. Should I go ahead and send them this message, this message, or this message, A, B, or C? And in doing so, you are taking the burden of thinking and strategizing and showing that that is something that you are capable of doing. Level four is to present a point of view. So to do all of the above and then saying, we could do A, B, or C. I suggest that we do B because of these reasons. Am I thinking about this in the right way? Level five is to share a default, is to say all of the above and say, I propose we do this. Let me know if you feel differently. This is a line that I love to use in the workplace because it shows that you're able to think for yourself, that if you don't have any additional guidance, this is what you do next. It allows your supervisor, your partners, your teammates to go from having to think really hard to just being able to say, yes, that sounds good. Now we're going to now move into territory where it requires a bit of trust. So number six is if you're already at this level of trust and teamwork with your supervisor and team, you might even be able to say, let me know if you feel differently before I go ahead and do what I said I would do, send this email, schedule this call, have this meeting before 12 o'clock, for example. And then finally, number seven, and you will see this among the most senior leaders in your careers, is to do all of the above and not even share updates because they now own this team, this department, this ministry, maybe even this government. And they say, I want you to let, I want to let you know that I did this because of this. Let me know if you have any questions or if you would like discuss further. So this means going from asking questions, open-ended questions, to suggesting ideas and to show that I can think for myself, I have a good head on my shoulders, and I can solve this problem even if you're not around. And I'm showing this to you when you are around so that you can trust me to operate on my own. And this means asking yourself, what would I do in the situation if my supervisor were not here to solve this problem for me. Now, you know the drill. I'm gonna move ahead to the next poll where I ask you, when it comes to asking questions at work, what level do you think you are at? And once again, keep open that pollev.com slash Gorik and evaluate yourself. I'm gonna go back so you can see which of these seven levels correspond to what. But once again, if you are learning English. If you're at level four English, here's your chance to get to level five. And if you are at level five, here's your chance to mentor someone who might be at level three, level four or below. Take a moment, think about where you are today or where you were in a prior position. And as you do this, if you've already determined which level you are at, I would love to hear from you as well about and this is a, a self-reflection exercise is to think about, okay, what could I have done differently? 
And if you think about someone in your career who has accelerated their career, what level were they operating at relative to their coworkers? So I'm going to skip ahead here and I'm going to see just a quick overview of where you all are at. I'm seeing a lot of level fours, about 24%, 20%, 20% at the level five and six, a number of you at three, two, one, and then 7% of you at level seven. I have just two more here when we're researching something. So now you've been passed with a project, you can't find the information or you can't contact this individual. Level one is to give up. Level two is to give what others asked for. So maybe you did find some information. You say, here it is. I found this information, go. Level three, however, means not just giving people what they asked for, but giving people what they didn't ask for, but that might be relevant in the situation as well. So for example, if you are researching a certain topic, for example, rural development, maybe there is a specific policy that you are asked to do research on. Well, maybe there's something else that is also related that would be relevant for you to research as well. So to say, here it is, but I also found this, which might be relevant. Level four, is doing all of that, but then explaining why others should care. So here it is. And I did this additional research and I think this might be relevant because of these reasons. Level five is to do all of this and then give an explanation for what this means for the broader objective in this meeting, in this, in this project. So the implication is what I learned from this extra research is that actually we shouldn't just be looking at this policy, we should also be looking at procurement policy. We should be maybe contacting our colleagues over in the finance ministry, et cetera. Level six, now this takes additional sophistication and awareness. It may not be something you can do right away, but it's to reframe the question altogether. It means saying, I'm thinking about the question that we're trying to answer with this research project on rural development. And I think what we're really trying to answer is this question. Maybe it's a tax question instead of a development question. The implication is that maybe we should look into this instead. Let me know if there's anything that I'm missing. And then level seven is to not just give these ideas, but to propose a next step. It's to say all of the above and to say, my suggestion is that we look into this next. Let me know if it'd be helpful for me to perhaps take this project on in the same way that Elizabeth did earlier. So it means going from gathering information and then dumping this information on others to synthesizing this information by asking yourself, okay, so what? Why is this even important in the first place? So once again, when it comes to research, what level do you think you are at? And this one we're going to have rather quickly. Just a few of you can respond and we'll take a look at where approximately you are because I wanna leave time for the panel as well. And I'm seeing a, a great split here across the different levels. Again, think about where you are and then try to take that next step to the next level. And then finally, I wanna move forward to the last one, which is when you're in meetings. One is staying quiet. Two is agreeing. So when someone calls on you and asks, well, what do you think? You say, yeah, I agree. Level three is to justify and to explain, I agree because of this. So again, showing that you have a good head on your shoulders. Four is something that's now more difficult. It's to critique. It's to say, I agree because of this, but this is the part that I'm not as sure about. Five is to critique, but then to also justify. Level six is to do all of the above and then propose, given all of this, have we also considered this? And then finally, level seven is to follow up perhaps after the meeting and to say, hey, I just wanted to follow up with you about the conversation that we had in the meeting. Let me know if it would be helpful for us to have a meeting after this to discuss this topic further so that your good ideas don't die in the meeting, they actually get implemented. It means going from following in meetings to now steering meetings, or at least contributing to the discussion and shaping the discussion by asking yourself, what is my point of view? Asking yourself, not just, okay, watching this meeting as if it were television, but instead being an active participant. Now, the final poll here asking all of you, when it comes to meetings, what level do you think 
you are at. And I'm gonna go back just one moment here. We're gonna spend less time on this poll because you all know the drill and hopefully you have a good sense of where you are each individually. But I'm seeing here, interesting, I see a number of you at, at the level six, which means that within this group, perhaps this is the one that you find most easy compared to some of the other ones. This is a good self-reflection exercise, I hope. Now, again, it means going from executing to strategizing. It means going from asking questions to suggesting ideas. It means gathering information to synthesizing information. It means following in meetings to steering in meetings. A plus B plus C plus D. So be in the head of state's seat because that could be you at one point in the future and not a constituent seat or a follower seat in everything you do. Now, at this point, you're probably, if, if you're anything like me, you're thinking to yourself, wow, that's a lot of information to take in. What do I do next? Well, this isn't my quote, but it's still my favorite quote. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. We've all had those career up and downs. You might be listening or watching this session today and thinking to yourself, wow, if only I had known this, I would have performed so much better. I would have navigated the situation differently. I would have had a different relationship with the supervisor. Well, those are all trees that you could have planted 20 years ago, or maybe just even yesterday. But the actions that you take starting tomorrow, those are the trees that you can start planting now. And like any tree, you may not see the results overnight or even in months, but over the course of, well, perhaps months, perhaps years, perhaps even longer than that, you'll look back at all the seeds that you've sown and realize that you've just created an entire forest of opportunities for yourself. And so I want you to just take a moment. I'm going to just gather perhaps five quick summary points from, each, from you all. What is one thing that you plan to do differently starting tomorrow? What is that one seed that you plan to plant? And I know that we are running short on time, so I want to make sure that we get through uh, this as, as quickly as possible. So I'm hearing be more vocal, be more assertive, ask more questions, speak my mind clearly. So I'm hearing already a lot of communication related next steps, steering in meetings, asking the right questions, reframing the question sometimes. Sometimes you aren't being asked to do what people want you to do. Being more focused, being more proactive, time management. I'm so glad that these next steps are mirror images of what you all shared at the beginning of this presentation. Being more vocal, yes, I love that. Speaking up and asking more. So we're seeing some patterns here. So I wanna give as much time as possible to the panelists. So with that, I want to now skip over to a feedback survey, which will activate automatically in your polled.com slash Goric links. I hope that you can participate. And those of you who share your email addresses will receive a resource from me on questions that you can ask your manager in your first day or first time on a project. And I hope you'll find that useful. If you found this webinar useful, please check out my book, tell a friend or colleague, give me feedback on that Poll Everywhere link that you already have active, and then find me on LinkedIn or on any social media platform that you use. And with that, I want to share with you perhaps the most important message that I should have began with, which is that these insights did not just come from me, it came from trailblazers like Elizabeth and so many others. And so it would really not do this research justice for me to claim these ideas as my own. And so it's with that, that I want to bring to the session here, five incredible trailblazers, inspiring women who have been in your shoes before, who can share with you how they navigated these unspoken rules to get to where they are today. The first is attorney Christine Tenedono, who is an assistant legal officer with the Civil Service Agency in Liberia. The second is Elizabeth Obengyoboa, who is the director of recruitment, training, and development 
within the office of the head of the civil service in Ghana. Third is Gloria Zezedol, who is the head of human resources within the Public Procurement and Concessions Commission in Liberia. Fourth is Nomtandazo Tandi Moyo, who is the deputy director general within the National Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development in South Africa. And then last, but certainly not least, is Dr. Yakama Manti Jones, who is the Director of Research and Delivery within the Ministry of Finance in Sierra Leone. Please join me in welcoming these five incredible women to the stage here. Please turn on your cameras to these five um, incredible women. And I have a number of questions that I would like to ask each of you. And I'm sure we're in for a real treat in learning from all of you. So I'm going ahead and stop sharing my screen so you can all see these incredible role models. Fantastic, all right. So I want to begin by asking each panelist here to tell us about how you got to where you are today. How did you start your career and what decisions and choices did you make that were critical in propelling you to your current position. And so with that, I want to go ahead and just work down the line. So perhaps a Kearney Christine, uh, if you could kick things off in sharing with us how you got to where you are today, tell us your story. Thank you, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, Christine Tenedolo from Liberia, I'm a lawyer. I work at the Civil Service Agency in the Department of Legal Affairs, and I am the assistant legal officer. Um, whilst I was in school, I always had this desire, desire to serve in the public sector. And there's this program that came up in my country called the President's Young Professional Program. And this program recruits exceptionally talented young librarians and train them and then place them in the public sector to be mentored by top level public servants. And so I got recruited on this program in late 2016, and I was placed in the office of the Director General of the Server Service Agency in 2017. And so I was an intern in the office of the Director General and I served as for administrative assistant. So I, I got in the public service at an entry level job. That is me, an administrative assistant. I, I interacted directly with my mentor because I was assigned in her office, but also I had this person that was supervising me. And this person was for executive secretary. Interesting to notice that I had come with a bachelor's degree, um, a, a postgraduate diploma, and this person had not even completed um, university. They were still in school. So um, the first thing is to understand that despite having a degree, this person had been here and they do the way around the office. And so I had to find a way to interact with them in a way that it won't be like exerting myself so high because um, quote unquote more educated, but also be able to learn and apply myself to, to let um, this office know that this um, person, young professional fellow that is here has something to bring to the table. So that's how I started rolling with my first position as administrative assistant. And I served in that position for about a year. And the more I, I applied myself, the more tax were being assigned to me. So at some point I started to coordinate the schedule of the director general. And before I could get there, people um, in the office and from outside had like free access to our office. And this is a very busy person that has a lot to do. So I thought um, this is something we have to do to regulate who comes into this office, schedule meetings in a way that should be able to check mark or to do list for the day. And so bringing that, that was welcome. And so we did that for some time. And then at some point I started being trusted to draft 
you know, communications that were to go outside of the agency. And to reach that level, there must be some level of trust. But I must admit my mentor was someone that is, she's very educated, she's very meticulous in her writing. So if you are doing communications for her, there'll be a lot of review and edits, not because you don't know what you are doing, but because she wanted, she wants it to be perfect. She wants it to be excellent. So I was there in, although I had some skills in writing, but I was hoping to get this improvement, to get this mentoring. And throughout the time, it, it was a good learning curve for me. I applied myself in this position. I made sure I came to work one hour early every day. Because at some point, I had to check her emails to know what she had, you know, pending that she should she respond to. I had to check the hard communications that came in because the office of the director general is like the bloodline of the agency. So whatever communications come in, we had to you know, disseminate those communications to the different directories and departments who were responsible to address those issues. And in that role, it helped me to understand the entire workings of the agency. And so I was patient to learn, I was dedicated, I was humble, and I put my time. I, I didn't care that maybe my supervisor was someone that did not have a degree, or I, was, I, I had this proximity to the director general, so I had to become um, so arrogant, no. I was humble. And while doing all of this, I applied to the law school because in, in all this, you, you can get the job experience, you can be dedicated, but never forget personal development. So on the side, I made sure I entered school. So I entered the law school and I, I imagine I did this internship for like two years before getting employed. So at the end of the two years, when I was finally at the point of getting employed, there was this opening um, with the examining committee of the Civil Service Board of Appeal. The, the Civil Service Agency has this um, quasi-judicial function, wherein we have this um, semi-court setup to address issues, uh, um, really labor issues arising from civil servants. And, and, and the administrators and agencies. So it's like the civil service is on one side and maybe the, the ministry they are assigned to or the agency is on another side. And this, this examining committee is there to you know, investigate and address those issues. So the fact that I was a young lady who was very dedicated, who was willing to learn, and I was also in school being trained to be a lawyer, I was in, in promoted now from administrative assistant to go and work as a complaints and grievance management officer with the examining committee. And in this new role, I was there to receive all complaints filed by civil servants to this committee. I also made sure that notice of assignments went out whenever we had administrative hearings. I also took minutes during our hearings and kept all records of the committee. And whilst doing this, I was very careful to learn from the administrative law judges because um, these three administrative law judges were there to listen to the parties, apply the civil service standing order. This is the book we use to, to address issues arising from civil servants and come down with rulings. It's a quasi code, right? So. We have rulings coming out of these um, administrative um, hearings. And the fact that I've been a law student and willing to learn in that environment, I was always keen to, to listen and follow the logic and the wisdom they applied in line with the law, how these issues were addressed, and also to watch their writings, how they wrote their rulings addressing these issues. And at some point, I volunteered to start to, to start to help draft some of these rulings because there are a lot of issues coming in and civil service are waiting for these things to be addressed because their livelihood depends on them. So I started to help in the process, you know, drafting rulings and maybe they'll just make their inputs to finishing touches and then these rulings will be issued out. Civil servants will have, will have redress. And then I did this for two years. When I graduated from the law school, 
I got another promotion and I was promoted to assistant legal officer in the department of legal affairs. So I have gone a step higher to, to um, assistant director level from an entry level administrative assistant. I'm now at an assistant director level serving in the office, in the legal department as administrative assistant. And in this new role, I, I assist the legal officer in drafting um, all legal documents, we review every document, every policy, every agreement. I have some, you know, legal honor tools on behalf of the agency. We represent the agency in, in litigation and court proceedings, but then I am still assigned with the examining committee to assist the administrative law judges in carrying out their duties and the investigation and coming down with rulings. Well, in this new role, I'm no longer taking meetings of the secretary, but I'm here now sitting with the judges and I come with more insight with my experience over the year and over the years in my training as a lawyer. I come with more insight, I contribute to, to these, you know, hearings and all of these things. And so it's- this is incredible. Um, I, there's, actually, as someone just mentioned, this is an incredible journey. Um, I, I just wanted to be mindful of time, um, wanted to definitely hear the unabridged version, but um, just wanted to also um, give uh, other panelists uh, a chance to contribute as well. There's definitely a lot more questions to go through. No, but please, please bring us to where you are, and then um, I would love for, for Elizabeth um, to, to carry things forward. Well, currently I'm um, in the role of the assistant legal officer, and it's interesting to note that um, one of those um, we consider as senior staff, I uh, attend senior staff meetings. Um, the youngest in the room at a decision-making table of the senior staff of the civil service agency. So there we are sitting now, and that's what I do. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Attorney Christine. I really appreciate your, your insights there. And as so many people said, well done. Clearly, there's a lot of hard work and proactivity that went into, into your journey. Um, Elizabeth, uh, please share with us um, in as, as, as concise but also thorough a way as possible your journey from where you, from how you got to where you are today. All right, great, great. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, everyone. Hi, everyone. I think I've already been introduced, so I'll skip that and then probably go straight to the point um, by saying that, yes, it's all started um, years ago, about 2003, when I joined the service um, to, to do my national service. In fact, those of you uh, who know about um, what happens in Ghana, immediately after your uh, um, 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 university education, you have to undergo one year national service. I didn't. Initially, I didn't set off to, you know, uh, wanting to actually work in a public service because oh, as a young person, I had witnessed, you know, how some public servants were behaving. Sometimes we have our ministries or our institutions have, uh, 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 happens to be in a particular place. So we call it a ministry enclave. You drive through or you walk through the ministry enclave and you're seeing some people sitting under, um, you know, trees and all that. I would just say to myself, no, I don't want to be part of this group. And so I have wanted to be in the private sector, but then uh, you don't get to choose where you have to be. So I happened to find myself in a ministry. Um, and then the ministry also pushed me into a department of, under the ministry. And so it just uh, started, you know, I was minding my own business, you know, trying to do what is right because I'm the person I'm one person that always wants to do what is right. And so I, my supervisor will tell me what to do and I'm, I'm doing it. And I'm, I'm not looking at what other people are doing in particular, because you know, if you know the public service and, and people always will talk about the conditions of service and all that. And so there is this kind of um, apathy and, and no people not wanting to do what they have to do and all that, probably because at that time, the supervision and all that was not that, that great. And so looking at all that and then looking at myself, I said, no, I don't want to be one of these people. So I just went about doing my, you know, the, my duties and making sure that everything is done uh, at the right time and, and appropriately. 
and, and meeting deadlines. I'm one person who oh, is very, very tax oriented. So I always want to meet deadlines and make sure what, what I am set to do, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it and doing it well. And so uh, fast track, well, after the one year, my supervisor then, uh, who happened to be the, the head of the department said, no, 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 I'm not letting you go. Because my, my aim was to probably go back to uh, go back home to go and look for um, a job in the private sector or something. He says, no, I will not let you go. And so on several uh, you know, uh, um, deliberations, we, I decided to, okay, so let me apply and see. I applied to, uh, to the, um, uh, the civil service and I attended an interview and I, I passed and I was taking on on and on and on. And because I had been with them uh, during the national service, I, I, I got to know some of the problems. And so then like you shared in your, your slide, I, I took upon myself to do a lot um, because one particular thing that I noticed was that uh, people's promotions were delaying. And it was probably because they were not doing what is right. You know, they, um, you have to, um, I know we'll be talking about a performance appraisal and all that, but you, it was one of the, the requirements for you to, um, to, uh, to be promoted. You know, you have to complete performance appraisal, you have to do this, you have, and they were not doing it. And so as young as I was, I tried to speak to them because most of them were matured. And I tried to speak to them that this is what it is. And we have an office. This is, the office is where I find myself now, <laughs> currently. Um, the office of the head of civil service, because that is the HR office that manages all that. And so I would visit this office and then I'll ask them, what is it that these people are supposed to do that they are not doing? And then I'll go back to them and then you know, try to sensitize them, try to engage them in these conversations and, and, uh, and on and on and on, they tend to you know, uh, buy into it and gradually um, their promotions, we started working on it and then everyone uh, started getting it. But we realized also that there was this particular, um, they, we had, they had very fragmented you know, grades and all that. So we had to streamline all that. And that called for a scheme of service that I mentioned and that was also done. Uh, fast track, I, I stayed there for some time. I worked uh, cordially uh, with everyone over there. People, re in fact, it, when I had to leave, it was really um, a border for a lot of a lot of them there because then I was always, you know, pushing for them to to get what they deserved and and all that. But then, as um, the current head of service spotted me, I did this scheme of service with him. He was part of the team, and then he said, no. You, you don't have to be at that place. You have to be at a place where you can serve um, the, you know, um, the broader um, people as in the service, as in the people in the service. And so he encouraged me that I, I should rather move. And so I moved, I moved to the service that I, I find myself currently about eight years ago. And uh, within that sp uh, space of time, I had received promotions, all right? But when I moved, I moved here and I received another promotion as a deputy director. And I found myself in the performance management um, 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 directorate where I also did so many things. There's so many, the time will not permit me to tell you all that, uh, to ensure that things were done appropriately at, at, uh, to, to reach out to everybody um, uh, in the service. And then um, a time came for me to be promoted to the director position. That is where I find myself currently. Currently, I'm the director. And then when uh, the, I had my promotion, you know, again, I, I had my superiors calling me and asking me, um, do I want to be uh, posted to another ministry? And I said, well, if, if that is possible, uh, then that can be done. Um, but they said, no, with your expertise and with your experience and all that, would rather we want you to stay here and um, be the director in charge of recruitment, training, and development. And Gorik, guess what? It wasn't only that, but uh, they added another directory. Um, I'm also in charge of um, reforms, coordinating units in this office, office of the head of civil service. So in a nutshell, this is my story. And this is how far I have come. So inspiring, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. And I'm seeing in the chat as well, just so many individuals among us saying, wow. I think that pretty much sums up how we all feel about your career, Elizabeth. Um, Gloria, please tell us how you got to where you are. Hello, 
everyone. Um, nice to meet all of you. Um, I'm Gloria Cezedo. I'm a librarian from Liberia, and I'm the head of Human Resources at the Public Procurement and Concessions Commission. So um, after the war, um, during President L.D. Johnson's relief regime, um, there was a gap within the civil service. Um, a lot of civil service had passed away or some were not as competent as um, they should be to push the workforce of White Bureau forward. And so um, with the help of the president and other professionals, the public and the President Young Professional Programs was established. That program was meant to place young graduates who were qualified enough, competent enough into government positions to help steer the affairs of the government they were assigned at. So I was one of those, and I was assigned at the public procurement and concession. So for sure, I would say PPCC. So um, I was placed in the policy division, and PPCC is a regulatory body that regulates procurement. In that position, um, there are a lot of brilliant people I met, unlike other people who went to other agencies, I met people that were not up to date with their profession. At PPCC, everyone were on top of their profession. But my department was male dominated. So what happened was I had to be visible. So even though I was competent, I had the knowledge, but obviously this, this male perspective about male leading and all of that were there. So um, I had to place myself in a position where I would be seen, my experience, my skill set will be shown. And so given that I was in the policy division, I started to look at the policies, the existing policies within the entity. What direction was the procurement space? How can we be on par with international best practices? and ensure that value for money is a thing. Because at that point, we were still looking for money. We, were, we had just come from war and we're trying to ravish all of the things that um, we had lost. And so the policies that we were bringing should be the engine of the commission to ensure that growth and sustainability is sustained in all government ministries and agencies. So what I did was I went and sign up for almost all of the different podcasts I could listen to. I signed up for Have a Business Review, The Economist. I mean, every single information I could get to broaden my mind as to the trend that was happening in the procurement space so that the policies that would be drafted within Liberia will reflect best practices, not just within our context, but within the context all over the context that is reflecting on the international scene. That gave me visibility because the policies that were drafted were different. They had different angles. And so for a while after I was pushing the corner, when I drafted the first policy, I had to find a way to get my boss to see what I was bringing to the table. With that, I started to be listened to, which is very important as a civil servant because no matter how hard you work, if your work is not seen, you cannot move past up the ladder. And so it was evident at that point that I had something. And so from that point on was, I was recognized. And so I worked in the policy division for a while and I realized that we had a lapse in our HR department. And so whilst working in the policy division, I started to suggest ways we could revamp our HR department. And so I started working in that light as well. So doing two jobs, more or less, because I had to work with the policy in the HR department. Long story short, we really don't have time. Um, after I started law school, the director general realized that there was a need to ensure that whatever gains we have made within building the human resource um, department of the institution should be sustained 
And so I was appointed as director of the human resource department. So basically currently I'm heading this department and we are looking at ways of sustaining not just the procurement department within the PPCC, but the whole procurement system within Liberia. Thank you. Gloria, uh, we have a participant who said, you are audacious. And I think that pretty much sums up your career path. Incredible, thank you for sharing your story with us. And uh, Namtandazo would love to hear about your story as well um, and, and how proactive and, and how much of a trailblazer you have been, please. Good evening, Gareth, and good evening to all the colleagues on the platform. Thank you for affording me this opportunity to share my experience. Um, I guess mine has not been a traditional out of school to varsity to work. I came from a family that, uh, a big family um, with parents that were really domestic worker and a stone crusher. So we didn't have money to go to university. So straight from matric, I went into work. I, um, which was a journey of personal discovery. Uh, nothing was laid out. You went out there to make sure you work. And I think I learned about myself and I learned about the work experience at the same time. Um, I started at the front desk of a, an NGO called Community-Based Development Program, which was a training institution. And as you said, I was not answering phone. I was the ears of the of the institution, if I were to rephrase that word. Um, and I, out of hard work and dedication, I moved from being a receptionist in that NGO. I joined the public sector in 1996 as a deputy director program management in the office of the premier of Gauteng province. And I uh, got promoted to a director governance I then went into local government in the economic uh, capital of South Africa, which is the city of Johannesburg, where I worked as an IGR specialist. Then I also headed the political office of the executive mayor of Johannesburg. I then moved on, on to national government where I worked in different departments. I worked in political offices in the department of local government and traditional affairs. I worked at the department of home affairs. Uh, I worked as an acting CEO in a government printing where we do security printing. I've been the chief of staff in the Ministry of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development. And here I'm in, I am today, I'm the Deputy Director General of Rural Development. So it's been a long journey of growth um, at different levels. Uh, um, and I think it's really out of the things you have said earlier on, Gareth, is you move from level one to level six or level seven, it's never been shooting up. And I've learned through, and I think what really put me through is the values and the principles I learned from my parents um, of being, uh, giving yourself out, um, having a listening ear. When you get into a working environment, put arrogance aside, uh, be there to learn, remember why you are there. And I think somebody spoke about it earlier on that you need to be clear about the goals that you want to achieve. Um, and I think issues around you knowing what to achieve in life, being able to manage yourself, manage your own personal goals, um, issue of consistency. I must say that it has not been easy moving from one position to the other because promotion process, even in the public service, it's not automatic. You do know that there is a assistant director, a deputy director, a director, a chief director, but there's no guarantee that you will just go from one level to the other. I would say key to everything is being able to put yourself out there, signing up for projects, volunteering to do work where you see you can add value. And you know, as you said earlier on with your story, there were times when you will see a project, you get interested, you don't know what it's about, but you are determined to get in and say, I'm going to jump in, I'm going to add value. And where you don't understand, you ask questions. So I just wanna say in a nutshell, I think for me that has been the point 
but more importantly is about acknowledging that when you are born, you are born for a purpose and you know that there's a purpose and a destiny that you need to achieve. So whatever you do, you jealously guard your behavior, you jealously guard even the attitudes that you have. Um, when you get into a work environment and you come with an attitude of I know all, the work environment has the ability to throw you out and basically just turn your life around. But I've learned that um, everywhere where you get in, you learn the environment, you learn the people that are there, you start to understand protocol and bureaucracy, which is very strong in government, understand who is who, understand who are the key linkages that, who are the decision makers. But very importantly, I must say, understand the culture of the ministry or the department or the organization where you're working on. And I found that I'm a person who, when I get into a situation, I study it first. I don't jump in and pronounce myself. I study, learn, and um, you know, there's a notion of strategy and tactics that first understand the environment and start taking your moves, uh, considering that you don't own your work environment. You are there to serve, you are there to learn, you are there to grow. And in a nutshell, that has brought me to where I am. It's the values I live by. I acknowledge that I'm just a piece in a bigger puzzle, that my contribution contributes to the overall vision of what the department wants to do. Today, as the Deputy Director General of Rural Development, I understand that in the national government of South Africa, there are different important components. And my aim is how do I contribute to the broader picture of ensuring that we have a country with citizens whose lives have been improved, whose quality of lives are better than what they were, and that issues of poverty, issues of inequality, issues of in unemployment are addressed as a collective. So let me stop there and not waste your time. Thank you. That was absolutely not a waste of time, <laughs> Tadezo. That was incredible. And I am reading the chat as you were speaking, and I see folks really resonating with your humble beginnings. I think you speak for so many of us on this call, studying the culture, and then reminding ourselves that we were all born with a purpose. Incredibly inspiring. Thank you so much. And over to Dr. Jones. Dr. Jones would love to hear about your story. And then as well, I would love to have you also explain what does ownership or leadership or, le or, or any of those topics, what does that look like to you now? Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And nice to meet everyone on the call. Um, so for me, I always like to start from the foundation. So where I am today started because like um, the first one of two career civil servants. And from the, my earliest days, it's been instilled in me that the way forward is hard work education and service. So throughout my early days from primary school, secondary school to university, I've always tried to be like an excellent student. And then when I graduated university at 18, immediately I started an internship at the Ministry of Finance. So I started as an intern in the Budget Bureau and then became a budget analyst and then moved on to the Economic Policy and Research Unit. And then I left to go study abroad and pursue um, postgraduate um, degrees and stuff, and then came back. But by the time I was finishing my PhD, Ebola struck in Sierra Leone, so I had to wait for a couple of months when it kind of like was under control and then came back. And when I came back, um, I went to join my husband in business. Then I saw an advert about joining um, the president post Ebola recovery team. So that's my first stint in the public service. And from there, I started as data management specialist, managing a team of 14 data analysts to build the data framework to track delivery of the president's um, recovery priorities for the post border project. And in that role, I worked there for like a couple, like nine months, and then the phase two started. Then I was interviewed for a higher position as information management and quality assurance specialist. So then I not only had to manage the data analysts, but also the quality assurance um, officers and my portfolio expanded beyond data analysis and management 
but also quality assurance for the information that was coming through to the team and synthesizing that for decision making with the top um, management. Then as I walked through the team, um, an opening came up for delivery team lead because our delivery team lead then was venturing into the political space. So I put myself forward to be considered for delivery team lead and then went to the interview and and then made it through and I became delivery team lead. But then what has worked for me from stage to stage has always been the op dedication and openness to continuous learning. Because what we learn in the classroom, we don't learn everything in the classroom. The workspace is really different. There are lots of skills that you learn on the job. And working with the delivery team, then it was DFID funded, now FCDO. So we also had like consultants from McKinsey and Co, Adam Smith International, the Soibaya Institute that were there providing technical assistance. So my role was not only leading my team, was actually actively learning from these global experts on how they do things, their tools, their processes, their thought process in how they problem solve. So at every point in time, I was learning from them and applying it in how I lead my team and also how I add value to the overall deliverables of the team itself. So it's, um, it's that self-belief that I'm not there to do the bare minimum and that foundation for my um, parents that as a public servant in whatever space you're in, it is your responsibility to actively contribute to make sure that your leaders succeed. So regardless of who's the boss, sex, gen, um, other beliefs or political um, affiliation, it is your responsibility to contribute to the collective and to the success of that team. So it always has been continuous learning, applying yourself, owning my deliverables and bringing the rest of my team along because you alone cannot deliver everything and it's and also having responsibility for a deliverable so not making excuses but making sure that whatever that comes to is good quality if it has if you need to put in the extra hours to make sure we don't miss deadlines put in the extra hours prepare for every single meeting don't just turn up and also making sure that you're dependable so if things come up in the last minute, to so just know that if Yakima is there, we can reach out and make and you guarantee that it will be done. So this is how I've been able to grow. And one of the things that also helped me is that post um, my work as a consultant across the um, delivery team and in different roles, um, I was able to transition post the elections to welcome another um, administration. So the team that I was working with was now in opposition and then we have a new government in place. And I was there to show that there's professionalism in my team, that we're there to, to make sure that every leader we have succeeds. So even though it's a new government, it's the same level of commitment and professionalism and dedication to, to, the, to the new government success. So that helped me and my team transition to the new role and then given all the years I've spent in um, working with the public service, but then as a consultant, I just told myself that there's a need to serve in a more permanent um, position within the civil service. So I applied for um, Director of Research and Delivery in the Ministry of Finance, because I saw the value add that data analytics and research brings to the policy management space. And that's where I am now leading my team and leading collaborative efforts to generate the evidence needed to drive decision making in the public manage, um, public financial management space in Sierra Leone. And one of the things that also helped me in this space is just knowing that if excellence um, speaks for itself, so never giving less than my best 100%, because in my spaces, I found myself to be the youngest in most of the rooms or the only female in most of the rooms. So if you don't come in prepared and show that clearly you're bringing added value, then you get left behind. So every time I seek to give not less than my best, and I think that commitment is what has also helped me grow and learning from whoever I'm working with, regardless of hierarchy or position, whatever it is good to learn that I don't already know, I always try to learn and share so that the collective can move forward. Incredible, Dr. Jones. And also I'm reading in the chat here, well-rounded, dependable, 
strategically positioning yourself, giving it 101%. Someone said, I am absolutely inspired. And I think that comment speaks for all of us as well. I want to move on to this idea of performance evaluations. And I would love to call upon Nantandazo, followed by Elizabeth, followed by Christine. So many of us have never received a performance evaluation before. And those of us who have may not have gotten very good feedback at all. What did your performance evaluation look like in your early career? And how did you act on that feedback, whether it was spoken feedback or whether it was you needing to read between the lines and read between the people and the politics. So Nantandazo, please take it away. Thanks, thanks, Gorit. I think for me, it was a combination of a spoken and uh, that which we have to read between the lines. Um, I have more of less of feedback where um, a manager would not sit you down and say, in terms of your performance, this is how you are performing. This is where you need to improve. I kind of grabbed it as the bus was running um, throughout my life. You do in government have a system where you get scored of whether you perform the one or a five. And sometimes you never even get an opportunity to meet your supervisor and discuss why are you a three or a four or a five. But I must say that there are instances where I've received feedback. Sometimes it's been very constructive. And I must say there are times where it's been very rough, where you find yourself sharing a tear or two um, in the manner in which it came. But I, I should say that overall, every public servant would want to receive feedback one that helps you to grow as a person, but grow professionally. Um, I've had instances where um, a manager will just tell you, this is not up to standard. And when you do ask, what, what is the standard that you expect? And there is no answer. And I understood that it means my manager himself or herself has not been appraised properly. Hence, they cannot appraise me. So how I turned it around is basically to say, let me learn from others, those that I work around me, observe those that seem to be doing better than me and follow through and ask them, how do you do it better? How do you write your documents better? How do you present your, 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 your projects better? And I found that the more you create a network around yourself, you don't only depend on your direct supervisor, but you create an enabling environment for others to also give you feedback where they say you, you either over summarize your memo or you don't check your quality. And I just also, which maybe I should say an important point, it's sometimes leaders are never taught how to appraise others. And we often have a high expectation of how they should do it that they should be empathetic, that they should be warm. The reality is that it is rough out there. It is rough for female leaders out there. There is no one to hold your hand and mentor you. So the things that I think Dr. Jones mentioned, you have to read up. Uh, you can't sleep five, 15 hours in a, in a day if you want to grow as a female leader in the public service. You've got to reduce your hours of sleep You've got to read a lot. You've got to read about leaders who have been regarded as astute, leaders that are held high on how do they do it. You know, um, and I, I must say that for, for those who might be listening to me and have received feedback that destroyed them or basically just demoralized them, there's a saying that says, turn your lemons into lemonade. And I've lived by that principle. Even though I share a tear, the minute I wipe it away, then I'm up again and I pull my socks through. So feedback, you get it positively or negatively, it's up to you how you move forward from there. I am where I am because I decided not to be let down by feedback that I regarded as negative or I regarded as anti-developmental feedback. So yeah, that, that has been my experience. I, it has helped me when I give feedback to others 
that I remember what I've gone through and I remember not to repeat what was done to me and be able to say to somebody, this is how you need to do it in order to do it best. So I must say that even in the public service, I've been in the public service for just over 30 years and um, I've never at any stage be taught how to deal with negative feedback until about a week ago when during my postgraduate, I'm doing an MPhil in corporate strategy with the University of Pretoria, Gibbs. And for the first time I was taught, how do you take negative feedback and how do you maximize that which you have been given and look for the positive point and focus on those. So it's rough, ladies out there, it is rough. It is rough for men as well. But when you know what you want to achieve, when you know that you are not there to be liked or to be pampered, you are there to grow. And grow, growth comes with pain. And you've got to accept that and you've got to embrace that and move on. The way you are focusing to is the destiny of where you're going. In between, you'll meet all those. And I want to encourage everyone, don't focus on the negativity. Focus on the areas that will make you a better person and a better leader. Thank you. Nantandazo, thank you so much for that. I'm. Uh, th there were so many incredible insights shared today that we unfortunately are running short on time and we have a lot more questions to get through. But to leave our, our, our audience here today, the hundreds of women from around the world with one tangible takeaway, could we have each panelist share one piece of advice that you would like everyone to walk away with. And for whoever has their tip first, go ahead, unmute yourself. We would love to hear from each of you. All right. So, Gorik, this is Elizabeth. Okay. So the one, well, one major thing that I want to, to, to tell everyone, we in a public service is, um, I think it's been said by other panel, uh, panel members, adding value to ourselves, making a difference, all right? We need to strive to make a difference in, uh, in, uh, in our endeavor, in trying to achieve a goal. And, and, um, and, and volunteering work, because for instance, for me, in my experience, I volunteered a lot, you know, I volunteered and I still volunteer. And if you ask me about the feedback that I receive, my feedback comes in a way of, um, me being asked to attend or um, represent um, the head of service in very, very important meetings, all right? So then, yeah, because it, it, there is something that has been seen in you, there is something that um, um, has been recognized, uh, there, there is that uh, confidence that you can do it. You can go out there and represent as high as the head of service. And so, that, that, that is it, make a difference, make a difference and, and add value to yourself. Thank you very much. Okay, so for me, what um, I want to leave the listeners to with is um, the difference between responsibility and accountability. So most of the time people think that you being responsible in the workplace is the same as you being accountable. But I want to share that accountability is a higher level of responsibility. So responsibility is kind of just sticking with the to-do list and ticking off the boxes that you've done it. But accountability is actually owning the results of your actions. So it's not about making excuses or blaming anyone or saying, oh, I've been given this task and I'm done with it. But it's actually not stopping until you make sure that you have the most efficient or best results from that task that you've been asked to do. And I think this is the higher level that we need in our societies, in the civil service, especially to change perceptions about the civil service, because in many countries, they just think that, oh, because the civil servants, they just do their job, they're not, it's, it's difficult for them to be sacked or relieved of their position. So they just go through the day in motion. So I think for everyone here, if we want to see our countries transcend the existing levels of development we have and leapfrog, I think we should be paying attention to be more accountable than just being responsible. And I think it's not just for the collective, if even you being accountable to yourself, you're getting out of bed early in the morning, driving through traffic, and coming to the workplace, you should make the best of the time that you've 
that you've given up. So it's not only about career development, it also guides you in making decisions, it also guides the actions, how you engage with the rest of your team, saves money, saves um, helps you with communicating well, and it builds trust. And trust not only with your colleagues, but trust with also your superiors. And it is when your colleagues and your superiors have trust in you, then your career will advance and then you can get to the highest levels that you wish to go to. So I think one takeaway is that we should stop being just responsible, but being more accountable. And just, uh, all right. All right, so one thing I want to leave with all of us is that as civil servants, we are the bedrock for our society when it comes to development. So whatever you are doing at every given point in time, you are contributing that quota to your country. And as such, imagine what you want people to say after you have performed that task. How are you leaving a legacy for your children? I believe that the civil service is moving into a direction of efficiency and effectiveness. It's no longer in the past where civil servants were just lackadaisical. Now civil servants are being more aware of their peculiar role that they are playing. So every civil servant should build something I call leadership assets. That asset that you can pull things from, you build your skill set in a way where even though you are not a leader at the particular level, but you start to exhibit your leadership skills. So that in great presentation, he mentioned the potential um, aspect so that the, your, so your superiors will see your potentials and they will know that the future of your entity can be dependent upon you. If we matter where we are in our, 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 our service, whether it is a sweeper, an accountant, whoever you are, if you see that particular position as your means of giving back to your country, then you will hold it with value and you will push yourself. Waking up early wouldn't be a problem. Pushing yourself to research and come up with best practices wouldn't be a problem. But if you see it as just a regular job and it's not the foundation of your country's development, then you wouldn't give your best. We all have a responsibility to contribute to the Africa we want through the different countries we are representing. And so I just believe that we should hold those values as high as we can so that our children will meet a better civil service than what we met. Thank you very much. Thank so, you, Gareth. My last words to say this continent needs us, all of us. I believe we are all leaders in our own right. Every single woman, this country, your own country, this continent needs us. So the each and every economy cannot grow. Governance cannot be clean and ethical unless us as women leaders stand up raise our hands, come out of obscurity, come out of hiding, come and serve your country, be ethical, be professional, be guided by the principles of Batupili, which puts your residents and your citizens first. And I know that the women of Africa have got the capability, have got the skills, have got the passion, have got the gifts that they have to turn this continent around. I will say, Ladies, raise up your hand, take a step and change this continent. Thank you. So um, as my last word to all of us out there, all these women who are listening, I just want to say when you are coming to the public service or coming in as a civil servant, come with the mindset of serving not what you can get from your government or not what you can get from the public service, but what you can give back. Do not have the mentality that you have to stick to the four corners of your team of reference or your job title. No, You have to learn how to go the extra mile. You have to be able to take initiatives when necessary, because if we cannot do it, then who will do it for us? 
we should always have this mindset. And in doing this, we should be consistent in integrity. Because if you want to give back and you truly have the heart to serve, you must do it with integrity. Because a lack of integrity will just be like a broken stick. You won't really get to where you want to get. So take initiatives, come with the mindset to serve, and that's what you can get. And always be consistent in integrity. It will take you so far, as far as you don't see now, as far as you cannot see for 10 years from now, what it will be for your own development and a great contribution to your country. And if you are making that contribution to your country, whether in a small tax or in a bigger position, whether as an entry-level person or as a top manager, once you have that mindset to serve your country and to do it with integrity, I must tell you, you are going to make a mark. You are going to be even a greater trailblazer than the women you see here today talking. So to all of us, let's serve with our hearts. Let's go beyond the four corners of our jobs and let's do it with integrity. Thank you. I'm taking a moment here uh, because I think <laughs> all of us in this virtual setting are just speechless by the passion, the commitment, the dedication, the competence, the consistency, the inspiration that you all have shared with us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for taking the time to share your wisdom with all of us. And it's really just an honor to be sharing the stage with all of you. And with that, I wanna hand it back to the Africa.com team and thank you all for this interactive session and for your engagement. I share what Gorik said at the end. I'm just speechless. There's nothing left for me to say. Thank you for your contributions to the continent.